right now it's really exciting. So the Cambodia Phnom Penh mission covers Cambodia and also the nation of Vietnam. So missionaries entered Cambodia just over 20 years ago, but since then they've baptized a lot of people. There are now 12,000 members of the church there. There are now over 3,000 active members in Cambodia. Um, there are now two stakes. As of this May or June, there they made two stakes, the Phnom Penh North Stake and the Phnom Penh South Stake. So for the first time, there are now high priests in Cambodia and they're organized wards and it's absolutely wonderful. It shows that the church is currently rapidly maturing there. Where, while just a few years ago, there were elders who were serving as branch presidents, and now all of the local leadership is local. While you could still, if you go to the provinces, you could still see the church is a bit less mature, while the missionaries are still helping out with the branch, trying to make sure that they're not doing anything crazy, still worrying about most of the activities, or maybe even the different branch activities aren't even happening, so... There are a lot of different problems, like the branch presidents or even the district presidents will ask the missionaries to help out with things, and often the missionaries will have to translate for the senior couple in leadership trainings. But I think the church in Phnom Penh, the capital city of Cambodia, has improved where they're no longer worried about the mission. It's completely independent of the mission by this point. So it's really exciting. So the mission includes two languages, Khmer, or also known as Cambodian and Vietnamese. Vietnam, as of about two or three years ago, allowed missionaries to enter that country. So now everyone who has, who is ethnically or part ethnically Vietnamese is able to serve in Vietnam. There are now three branches there established. So actually the church over the last couple of years has had a lot of baptisms in that country. So if you're going to, if you we're called to this mission, speaking Vietnamese, and you're ethnically Vietnamese, you should probably be pretty excited about that. But there are also Vietnamese-speaking missionaries in Cambodia, but typically over the last few years, it's been a little bit rougher there because there's been a lot of racism against Vietnamese people in Cambodia. The mission has, I believe as of this week, 150 missionaries. It's grown a lot. When I first started, there were maybe 90 or 95. And a few years before that, there were maybe only 60. So it's gone from a small mission to a normal-sized mission. And that's pretty exciting. And also, before, there were just four other provinces in Cambodia open to missionary work. But this week, they added two more. They're called Preveng and Bolsat. So I'm super excited that the church is starting to expand into new places in Cambodia. There are more missionaries coming there, and they're being sent to new places, and they're going to establish the church in these wonderful new places, and more of the Cambodian people will be able to hear about the message of the restored gospel. Cambodia, first of all, is a very hot country. Most of the time it was 90 or 95 or 100 or even 105 in like 99% humidity. So when you're biking for like 5 or 10 miles each day, you sweat a lot. In Cambodia, you're always wet. You're either wet from being sweaty or you're either wet because it's raining outside. But you're usually not very dry. Cambodia is also a swamp. There are a lot of rivers. There are a few lakes. And often places get flooded. So sometimes you have to walk through water that's up to your knees or sometimes even up to your hips. So it's quite the adventure. So getting to Cambodia, I thought I've spent several years of my life in Asia. And I thought I'd actually been to Cambodia before my mission. I thought I knew sort of what Cambodia was going to be about. I was dead wrong. Cambodia is sort of like other Asian countries, but because of recent history of war and other civil struggles, Cambodia is sort of 30, 40, or even 50 years behind the times as compared to other countries, even in Southeast Asia. So Cambodia is very poor. I had to deal with the people who have been influenced a lot by poverty, who have been influenced a lot by recent political regimes, who have been influenced a lot by the superstition and the traditions of their fathers. So they carry, the Cambodian people carry a lot of baggage. And society there carries a lot of baggage that goes all the way back to Pol Pot. And, but it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Even though it's so hard, even though it's so rough, even though it's so interesting. It's absolutely amazing. Cambodia is so fun. 
It is so amazing. It is so inspiring. It is so exhilarating. And at the same time, it is so hard. It is so challenging. It is so depressing. And it's just organized chaos all at the same time. So when I got there, I had to become used to my body went through a lot of different transformations. In the first couple of months, I probably lost about 30 pounds. So that's partly because you lose a lot of weight when you're sweating a lot. When you're riding your bike a lot, you also have to get used to new food. Many of the elders, when they get there, they lose a lot of weight because they get jarty or dysentery or something like that. So they might go diarrhea for 50, 60, 75 times or something nonstop for three or four days. So that's a little bit scary, but that usually happens. A lot of missionaries will end up getting parasites or other diseases there. And actually over time, most of the missionaries get used to it and their bodies adapt to the environment. But environmentally, it's quite an adjustment. I would say as a country, it's a very high medical risk nation. And because of that, we just have to assume that the Lord will, the Lord will save us. There is a scripture I remember in, I believe it's in Mormon, where it talks about how, um, how the Lord's missionaries will be able to eat things and not be poisoned, will be able to handle snakes and not be poisoned, that they'll be able to speak new tongues, that they'll be able to do miracles and do mighty works. One of the nicknames of Cambodia is the Kingdom of Wonders. I love that because Cambodia is a kingdom of wonders. It is some place where you can expect the unexpected will to happen. You expect miracles to happen. You expect crazy things to happen. It's almost as if the normal rules that we know in life here in the Western modern world that we're so used to don't really exist there. The cultural differences there are night and day different. So first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about Cambodian religion. They're very, very Buddhist. Yet at the same time, they don't really realize that their form of Buddhism is not very, is not very kosher, not very correct per se. They sort of mix it in with Hinduism and Chinese ancestor worship and other folk and other previously tribal and shamanistic traditions, including animism. So there's a lot of different beliefs that are sort of mixed in. So they think they're Buddhist, but in actuality, they practice a lot of things that aren't very Buddhist. They have very much the perception that everything's good. They say, which means do good, you get good. That's their basic assumption. So when we're coming in as missionaries, we try to teach them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They sort of think, oh, Christianity, I'm sure it must be a good thing. They don't really know anything about Jesus Christ or about Christian religion or much about that, but they just think, Oh, it, it, it's probably good, it's, but they don't really have any desire to leave because leave Buddhism because it's the traditions of their fathers. They're completely bound to it. So that's one problem that makes it a little bit hard in contacting. I remember in my first area, we contacted, we tried contacting down every single road. We probably contacted hundreds of people, and most of the people, they were just like, I'm Buddhist. So we didn't really get a whole lot of investigators or even baptisms out of context. I feel like the most effective way was through members' referrals. Because members, when they give out a referral, they're giving out someone they trust, someone that they know. And when the members receive the gospel, it is able to bring a light upon them like no other light they've known before. The Cambodian people have experienced so much darkness, even within their own lifetimes, and even before then. It is a country that is filled with spiritual darkness. And finally, within the last 20 years since the missionaries have come to Cambodia, the restoration is able to penetrate the lives of those people and is able to take the shades of darkness out of their lives, out of their eyes, and they are able to see with a new perspective and the gospel is able to change and transform their lives, is able to make their spiritual lives better, and is even able to make their temporal lives better. So, when that change happens, some of their family members hopefully notice it. 
Some of their friends or neighbors might notice it, and some of those people will want to learn about the church. So I found it was very effective to contact, not just once, but again and again, and talk to and interact with the neighbors of members and the family members of neighbors of those members. So when you get to know those different social circles, you're able to penetrate those, and they start to realize that you're more than just this crazy Frenchman. Oh, by the way, they think all Western people are French over there for some reason. And they're able to see that you're more than just this missionary, that you're a human being, and that you have something that can help them. Yet again, another problem there is that many people want to learn about the church because they've heard that they can get some type of physical benefit from it. There are a lot of organizations, NGOs in Cambodia, that try to help a lot of poor people because poverty is a big problem over there. So many people have the assumption that we're some sort of NGO. We have to explain that we're not, and we can't tell them that we're going to try to help them. They have to be able to come into Christ first spiritually before they can receive any type of physical assistance from their branch president or bishop. They need to be able to enter the waters of baptism, have a firm testimony, contribute to the church before they're able to receive anything in return physically. So Cambodia, as you maybe have heard, has had a very turbulent history. So for most everyone's lives, they've, they've had a very hard life. If we go back in time, Cambodia used to be this great, amazing empire where there was Angkor Wat as, at its center in what is now known as Siem Reap. So it had this huge different temple complex and they used to be Hindu and they were a big empire that had this massive military that controlled most of Southeast Asia. Over time, there are different kingdoms that were established, namely Thailand and Vietnam, and they started to peck off little parts of um, Cambodia and eventually got a lot weaker. They moved their capital away from Angkor Wat, moved to Phnom Penh, where the, where the influence, where there's like the, where the Don Le Basak rivers and the Mekong River meet. So it's a nice trade port. So they decided to move it there, but actually the Thai were able to conquer Siem Reap, so Cambodia was a bit weak. Cambodia decided to make a deal with France in order to help Cambodia protect itself from its neighbors. But Cambodia got a little bit ungrateful and long story short, France decided to invade Cambodia and Cambodia became a province of France called French Indochina along with Vietnam and Laos. And also later during the 1940s, there was obviously the Second World War. They were, um, colon they were occupied by the Japanese. They had a war for independence against the French, which they won quite easily in 1954. And then later on, Cambodia had a very arist aristocratic class that was very rich, while most of the people were peasants. During this time, there was a war in Vietnam, so there were a lot of communists insurgency. There are a lot of communist guerrillas out there and someone that was supported, I think, with communist Chinese funding named Pol Pot was able to convince all, most of the peasants in Cambodia to come and follow him. And he started something called Khmer Krahom or the Khmer Rouge. He was able to get a group of communist guerrillas and over the few years he was able to grow his base and was able to attack, attack the city of Phnom Penh and he was able to overrun the country. So over the next four years, Cambodia became a political prison house. The, all the cities were evacuated. He wanted to make Cambodia a completely primitive society. He wanted to erase everything that was Western, everything that was modern, everything contemporary, so that the people would be able to all live in this communist perfect harmonious state, which obviously could not exist if there were bourgeoisie people or other aristocratic people floating around. So all those people were killed or they left the country and all the people were working in the fields and they were pretty much working in death camps. He starved the people. He, he sold all the rice to China in order to get weapons for the Khmer military. And sadly, people got more and more hungry. And what happened was in 1979, Vietnam, knowing that Pol Pot was 
very vulnerable because his government was was obviously very weak. They decided to invade Cambodia. They took over the country, occupied it. And so Pol Pot and his friends were hiding out of the jungles, while most of the people actually decided to leave. They could not stand being in their home country anymore just because they had been through so many problems. Just maybe two or three million people had died by that point, and millions more had left the country, gone to Thailand or Vietnam or the United States or someplace else, and they were internment or refugee camps. So a lot of people went to Thailand. So for most of the time, during the 1980s, Cambodia was like the Stone Age. There was no economy there, and most people living there were, were living under Vietnamese military occupation. But in 1993, the king of Cambodia, who had escaped before the Khmer Rouge had entered, came back there and had declared his new kingdom and the he his son was actually the prime minister but in 1997 the old military puppet leader Hun Sen who was backed by the Vietnamese came back to power and they had a little bit of a feud there was a small civil war and Hun Sen won so pretty much they've had the same military Went to dictator since about 1980 something. His name is Hun Sen, and that pretty much explains the situation since then. There was an election back in 2013. I will say it was a shame. Uh, it was a sham election. Like it was not. It didn't really go through the democratic process. There was someone. There was someone who opposed Hun Sen named Sam Ramsey, and he lost. But we think it's a fraud election. So apparently, pretty much Cambodia has been led under one party called the Cambodian People's Party for the last 30 years or so. And it's not been very good for the people. Like, I think on paper, it's a democratic country, but in reality, not really. They serve limit freedoms. Like, for example, as us missionaries, we cannot engage in aggressive proselyting. That means we can't just knock on doors. We could talk to people as we meet them down the road, but we can't really like knock on people's doors. We can't just sit up, like stand on some box and Dan Jones it. We can't just like hand out all these pamphlets wherever we go. We sort of have to be a little bit more, um, less aggressive, but that sort of explains Cambodia now. So because of all those wars, Cambodia is a very poor country and they're trying to restart their economy. They're very into the textile industry. They actually, grow a lot of rice there, and tourism has also helped the country. But overall, it's still a very poor, very backward, very third world country that is still not quite up to modern standards. Like for example, technology there is a bit behind. There is like intellectual property rights don't exist there. It's a very fun place though. Food there, I think it's absolutely amazing. At first I thought it was a little bit weird but I got used to it pretty quickly. They eat a lot of stir fries over there. They eat a lot of uh, different types of soups or curries or stews. They eat a lot of rice. They eat a lot of noodles. And a lot of the food there is really sour. They love their unripe fruit. So they will eat unripe mangoes with pepper and chilies and stuff. They will eat unripe whatever. They will pick stuff off the trees and they will tell you, oh, it's going to be really sweet, Elder. And then you try it and then it's extremely bitter or extremely sour. I even tried, I think, salted banana peels once. I remember trying things that were probably as sour as warheads. It was very interesting. So food-wise, the members, even though, even though... There's a mission rule that you can only eat at members' houses once a week. The members will always try to feed you as much as possible. They will always try to buy little snacks for you, buy these little sweet crackers for you. They have things called nooms, which is sort of a generic term for everything that's like sweet or baked goods or fried goods. So they'll often try to give you like these little, um, I think in English they'd be called moon cakes. They would often give you little different Cookies, they're not exactly like cookies how we know in America, but they're sort of like these Cambodian baked goods, so they're always trying to give us fruit or something, so they never want the missionaries to starve. But sometimes you have to interact with some members who always try to give you a lot of food. Like I remember in one area there was this lady who would feed us twice a week. She had 
dozens over her over the past couple of years she had introduced maybe 30 40 or even 50 people to the gospel so we knew we had to eat her food no matter what she made so often we had like the stew that had like squash and fish paste in it and it tasted a little bit weird sometimes we would have like roasted or fried rat so we had a lot of interesting meals when I was there. That wasn't normal though. Usually they ate a lot of really good stir fries. The fried rice over there is really good. The fried noodles over there is really good. Their curry is absolutely to die for. And they have a lot of other really good things that they eat over there. When you're going out to eat, it's usually very cheap. It, you're paying maybe one and a half dollars, maybe two dollars for a meal that you can eat as much rice as you want. You'll probably get really full. So you don't have to spend much money when you're there on food. Alligator is pretty good. It sort of tastes like maybe about 80% pork, 20% fish. It's a pretty nice meal. I also had dog, but I felt really bad about having it because there were some members that raised dogs and convinced us never to eat dog again. But that tastes sort of like pork. But it tastes, I think, a little bit more like rat. But you've probably never had rat. I've also had... What else is crazy? I had this really weird salad once. It had a lot of, usually they use a lot of different, um, a lot of different types of leaves and a lot of different types of things like parsley or like Thai basil. So they use a lot of different things, sort of like mint in their cooking, especially in different types of salad. I remember this one salad that I think was raw, that had a lot of raw beef. And I was trying to make it spicy just so it was going to be more edible and putting in the lime juice and smashing up the peppers. I remember one time smashing up the peppers in one of the seeds flew and got stuck in my eye. So my eye was in fire for an hour. So sometimes the food there is very spicy. Sometimes it's very salty. Sometimes it's very sweet. They know how to put a lot of sugar in their food. So you should probably watch out if you have diabetes or if you have other, other medical concerns. But overall, I remember it being very sour. So Cambodian, otherwise known as Khmer, is a Mon Khmer language. That means it's descended from an ancient tribal language called Mon. So it's technically the cousin language of Vietnamese, but it's a little bit different though because during the Angkorian period, over a thousand years ago, Khmer was heavily influenced by Indian languages, namely Balay and Sanskrit, where they all of the military terms, religious terms, and other civilized terms came from those Indian languages. So a lot of the times when you're speaking as a missionary, a lot of the religious terms are terms a lot of people wouldn't really know because they're ancient Indian words. So when you're teaching people, you sort of need to explain, you sort of have to go through a glossary of words like, what is a prophet? You have to explain very clearly what a prophet is, like what's the priesthood, like different basic words so they're able to understand. So back to the language, the Khmer language, because of those Indian roots, has a very interesting script. It is the world's largest alphabet, maybe 120 or 130 different symbols. It's very, very complex, so different consonants when they were with different vowel sounds, they actually make different vowel sounds. So even though a consonant ka is with an a sound, if consonant ko is with an a sound, it becomes a kia. So instead of a ka, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about now, but when you learn, start learning the script, you'll understand. So kama is very interesting. It's not tonal per se, like Chinese or Vietnamese, but it has a lot of different contrasts. It's sort of like a pitch register language where how you accent certain things will change the meaning of the word, like how hard you say it, or how long you say it, or how you say it, sort of like Japanese, where how, like, I'll give you an example, like, go means death, but go means um, ox, or bratian means to bless or bratian means president. So pronunciation wise, it's a very hard language. There are like 50 some different vowels. So good luck with that if you're trying to learn Cambodian. Another really funny thing about it is that there are a lot of different levels of um, respect. There are maybe about seven or eight different levels depending on whether you're a child or if you're being vulgar, if you're talking to your grandparents or the king or a monk. They have different languages associated with that. So that means for different verbs, there are about seven or eight different forms of that verb. 
So if you want to be rude, you could say the word si, which means eat. Or you could say nyam, which is a little bit more formal, or ho. Or if you're being really formal, you could say uh, sa. Or you could say um, like there are different levels for that same different word. So each verb, you have to change the verbs based on who you're talking to. So you always have to vary. And different words for you, they don't really have a word for you per se. You have to change the word for you based off who you're talking to. You call everyone based off your family relationship. So if they're your, like, if they could be your older brother, you call them older brother. If they could be your uncle, you could call them uncle. If they could be your granddad, if they're about the same age as your granddad, you'll just call them gramps. So you just call people based off of that. So another interesting thing is they, because during the Pol Pot era, a lot of people were under a lot of anxiety and they were very worried about being killed. They created a lot of, like, pig Latin type languages. So they're able to play on the different words. So they're able to mix words around. So there are about three or four different pig Latin type languages that they use in Cambodian where they love to play on words and now that's just become part of their culture. So sometimes you might not have any idea what they're talking about, but that's just because they're playing on their own words. Like, sok sabai means how are you, but sometimes they'll just say sai sabo. So sometimes they'll just mix around those words. So it's a very fun language to learn. And, but is is absolutely wonderful language to learn. It's very hard, but the good thing about it is the grammar is very easy. And there are a lot of changes happening to it, especially in the city of Phnom Penh. A lot of times they become very lazy in how they speak. So sometimes they'll drop different sounds and sometimes they'll even like add these different tones. Like, so like the word for five, bram, will become piam. So sometimes they'll do a lot of different weird things. So it's a really, really fun language to learn. So the people there are very, very friendly. I loved serving in Cambodia because the people there are so receptive. Even though they may not even want to listen to what you have to say, they just want to be friends with you. Maybe that's just partly because we're American or we're not from Cambodia and they haven't had much interaction with foreigners speaking their own language, but I think they genuinely love other people. They have the, abil they have the ability to make friendships very easily. So it's very easy to enter people's homes, be able to talk to them and have long, even intimate conversations with them. And they're very open about these things. They're also very funny. They're very humorous. They're very open, even if they're having dinner and we sort of walk by their house, they might call us in and say, hey, come eat with us. And we, of course, are like, no, 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 maybe, maybe another time, but maybe we could give you something like a pamphlet or maybe a flyer for English class or maybe a little pass along card or something. And so it's very easy to contact people, but yet again, it's sort of hard to get investigators out of it because they're very Buddhist. They're very culturally, they have very strong cultural and family connections. Family there is very, very important. So another problem there about joining the church is there might be family opposition from their parents or even their grandparents. They might be adults, but still they might decline to be baptized because the grandma said no. So their family connections, that's something that we could build on because we teach that families will be able to be together forever. And even though the members are very poor, I still knew quite a few of them who had been, who were able to sacrifice the money to be able to go to the Hong Kong or Manila Philippines temple so they could be an eternal family. So usually family units, they live all together and that includes maybe three generations so it's very easy to connect to both the grandparents, the parents, and the children. So that's one thing I love about Cambodian culture is their emphasis on family. And it also makes them cause, it also causes them to always remember their families. Often, especially among young people, usually in their 20s, they often leave their hometown or their rice field or wherever they're from, their little village, and they go to Phnom Penh, which is the capital city, to try to find work, which is usually pretty hard. They usually try to find work doing factory work, or maybe they ride people around on their motorcycle and try to be a motorcycle taxi guy. Some of them might work in restaurants or, 
or maybe they try to sell at the market or do other things, even though they're alone, they're not with their family members, they constantly remember their family. Like every other month, they're always trying to go back and forth between their hometown and the city, which also causes a lot of problems in missionary work is because sometimes we try to meet with a lot of these people. A lot of the investigators that we have are usually in this age range, usually like 18 to 30, single. So we try to meet with them and all of a sudden, without a moment's notice, they're already gone and they went back to their homeland. And we don't know if they're going to be gone for six hours or for a day, a week, or a month, or if they're never going to come back. So they're always thinking about their family. They're always trying to support their family. So many of them work very hard, doing very hard, arduous jobs in order to support their families. So that explains, I would say, many of the Khmer people. Cambodians are also known as Khmer's, by the way. But some of them, I would say, are actually quite lazy, like to sleep a lot of time. Cambodians love to sleep. Like, usually, they will go to bed at 8 or 9 just so they're able to sleep even more. And they'll go to, they'll take a nap in the middle of the day, like at 1 to 3, just so they're able to sleep even more. So they love to sleep. And they also love to eat. Food is something very important to their culture. Effective missionary work in Cambodia results from interacting with the members. If you're not able to interact with the members, you will not be able to get very far. Referrals was key to my success in my mission. I remember serving in this little village out in a province called Badambang called Kamung Prea. That literally means God's village. So maybe it was prepared by God to receive the gospel. But there, we constantly worked through a few different members to get referrals. And over the course of a couple of years, um, only at first there were just a few members there, but after a little bit of a while in this little neighborhood, there may be 50 members there. So a lot of people get baptized there because of these family relationships and these referrals. Another thing they do, they have in the mission, is something called a CBR, a convert baptismal record. A little sheet of paper where you see a picture of them, some little bit of information like their birth dates, like phone number, an address, where they live, and a few other notes about their personal life. And so you have like this different directory of different notes and different pieces of paper where you could just browse and look through the different members of the branch or ward where you may serving. Often these different pieces of paper might be really old, like 15 years, so sometimes you'll have to try to find a lot of less active members. I found a lot of new investigators trying to find less active, less active members, talking to their families, contacting their neighbors, trying to bring them back into Christ. A big emphasis in the mission is less active in recent convert work because there are so many recent converts. Like in 2013, I believe there are 800 people baptized in that mission. So you need to work with a lot of recent converts. We need to be able to get them, make sure they're able to come back to church. Because a lot of them, I would say, are only marginally active. There are a lot of people in Cambodia because they're poor or maybe because of distance issues. They only come to church maybe once or twice a month. Well, if they really had stronger testimonies, they would be coming four times a month. So there is a lot of recent convert work to be doing. There are a lot of less active or completely inactive people out there in Cambodia already, even though the church is young, that we need to find and that we need to be able to help them come into Christ. And I really feel like from those people, we get most of our investigators that get baptized. So when we're working in Cambodia, we need to always try to make sure that we have a member present who is able to help us bear the message of the truth. Like, it's sort of hard to expect them to change their religion, especially if we're, we're Christian. We've always been Christian. We're born this way. But it's more powerful when someone who before was like them, who was Buddhist, who became a Christian, who became a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who gained their own testimony of the Book of Mormon. So working through members is very, very important over there. And if we don't, then maybe the branch will falter. It's very important that we be able to bridge these friendships with the members so we're able to learn their names, know what they do for a living, learn where they live, interact with them, so that the members love us as missionaries and we're able to serve them continuously. Service is something we're able to do a lot over there, like build their homes, uh, work in rice fields, 
clean their houses, do their yard work, work on their farms. There is always a lot of service to do over there. Sometimes it's even air contact. When we ride our bikes, we stop and we wash someone's dishes by the side of the road or try to wash someone's clothing on the side of the road. They don't have washing machines or like dish or dishwashers, so they have to do that manually over there. So that's, there are always opportunities for service over there. A few other interesting things about Cambodia is often the members will do different weird things. We always need to make sure that they have strong testimonies. I feel like it's getting better, but a lot of members over there, I feel like are not up to par with church standards. Like several times, even I caught a lot of members, even an elders quorum president once, drinking. The word of wisdom is a huge problem over there. Beer, Cambodians love their beer. They love to drink. So when the different main holidays come up, we need to be on the, oh, we have to be on the lookout. We might run into someone and we have to be able to deal with, we have to be able to know what we're going to do if we find a recent convert or some other branch leader caught drinking. Like, what are we going to do when that happens? What are we going to do when we see them smoking or something or do, other, some, do something else that's against the uh, commandments? Well, the commandments there that they keep really well, I would say, though, is the law of chastity. Overall, Cambodians are very chaste people. I didn't really see pornography over there. I don't. I believe most people over there they're actually they're actually pretty faithful to their spouses, and they don't engage in premarital sex. So it's a lot different from America. Like one time, a few different. People were asking me in America, they asked me, hey, in America, I've heard people are really unchaste. I bet like only half the people in America keep the law of chastity. And we're like, no, it's probably lower, like maybe 10% or something. And they're like, no, no way. America couldn't be that bad. So over there in Cambodia, it's, it's still pretty good just because they're very family oriented and they're still, they're, they have a lot of different cultural values. They're still very good. But some of them are completely different. Like they love to, they're very open. They're so open. If you have ugly teeth, they'll tell you you have ugly teeth. If you're fat, they'll tell you you're fat. They will just speak their mind and they don't even care. And they will think it's so funny. Another few different interesting things is they're, they're so poor. Like I remember one area, everyone was just collecting garbage to live. Like there was a literal mountain of trash that was an old garbage dump that was on fire and like there was like a moat of slime and stuff around it. So that's sort of like their living circumstances in some parts of the city and out in the country a lot of people live in jungles. You could sort of imagine being like Indiana Jones cutting those trees and trying to cut through those vines in order to get through the village. A lot of roads out in the country are dirt roads. So when it rains it's really really rough because it gets super super muddy and sometimes the mud, the mud there is really, really strange. It dries super fast. It's almost like, it's like, it's almost silky. It's like, um, it's like clay. So as soon as it dries, the bike is completely stuck because it's already turned into stone by that point. So you have to use a stick to try to get all the stuff out. Another interesting cultural thing is that, um, they don't really cover themselves nearly as much as Americans do. So you will, every day, you'll probably see a lot of naked little kids running around. And after a little bit of a while, you'll be completely, you'll think it's completely normal. A lot of women breastfeed in public. And at first you'll think it's really, really strange. And you'll be like, ah! but after a while, you'll get completely desensitized. And you'll probably, you might even think it's, normal. So it's a little bit weird. They have a lot of different cultural values and expectations over there that are completely different. So my advice is just to go in with an open mind, just try to adjust to the culture he ever, even though it's going to be really, really rough. And I hope you have a really fun time. Missions a fun place. I remember one thing I did every week was English class. That was rather fun to teach English to people who don't really know how to speak that much English. Um, that actually brought in quite a few investigators. It's actually become more successful lately. 
where a lot of people, one wonderful thing about the churches there is that over the last two or three years, they've built a lot of buildings there. So it's become a lot more visible. The church has built these large new meeting houses. So a lot of people now already recognize where the church building is. So we could tell them about our English class. And even though they might not have any interest in leaving their Buddhism or interest in Christianity, we could tell them that, oh, here's an English class here at the church. And we could tell them that, oh, it's going to be fun. We're going to have activities like every week. You should come and bring your friends. So that was one way to bring a lot of people to the church. One more thing is there is also a Chinese class there. There are also a lot of other cultural activities there. I think at one point there was even like a computer class. I've also heard of different cooking classes they've had there, like piano class. So being a missionary in Cambodia, you're probably never going to get bored. There are always things to do with the members. There are always things, there are always things to do to serve the members, teach them, able to strengthen their faith. We really work on the members and other people who come to the church building. A lot of members hang out of the church a lot, so it's a lot of fun. It's always fun hanging out with the members. I will say maybe that's not the most effective thing to do, but sometimes it is because you become the members' friends and you get a lot of referrals. So, serving in the Cambodia Phnom Penh mission is a lot of fun. You, sometimes it's a little bit discouraging, but you will be able to make a lot of friendships with other missionaries. The zones are usually pretty close together. There is a core mass of maybe about 60 or 70 missionaries in Phnom Penh, so you get to know each other quite well. While as in other missions, they're served more spread out. But in our mission, you're able to get to know all, usually most of the elders and sisters that serve there, you will get to know pretty well. I had a crazy mission. So I had the record in my mission of serving in 10 areas. So I was always on the go. I don't think I was in one area more than four months or more than about three transfers. So it's really rough, but I got to be able to know a lot of different people. I got to know a lot of people that got baptized, a lot of people that got rescued, and I got to know a lot of different church leaders over there. So for that, I'm very grateful. Um, a few different stories. Um, one interesting thing I remember doing is, um, before my mission, I spoke Chinese. So me and one other companion that I have, who is from Hong Kong, were speaking Chinese for a transfer because there are a lot of, um, members of the Chinese diaspora over there. There are a lot of Chinese people in Cambodia, but that didn't really work because all of those people speak Khmer anyways, or Vietnamese. So that was a little bit rough. So I had a bit of a time for one transfer where I could go anywhere I wanted <laughs> in the entire city. So I got to know the city of Phnom Penh really, really well. It's a crazy place. The traffic is crazy. There are like trucks and buses going everywhere. So if you're riding your bike, please be careful. But I probably had like eight or 10 or 12 bike angels. If you're going to be serving over there, chances are you will miraculously survive some type of bike accident. I know missionaries there who have been hit by cars and trucks and they miraculously survive. It's absolutely amazing. I personally have been in several bike accidents when I first started on my mission and I was never harmed. I don't know how it happened, even though a moto hit me. I thought my bike would be completely broken. I thought my back would be completely broken, but the Lord really protects his missionaries. One more few different stories I remember is that I, I loved teaching different families. I remember the first person I baptized. I remember telling him about the temple and how he needed to be an eternal family. He was just baptized, but he was already going inactive. And he said how he had to work really hard to be able to support his family. And I asked him, why? And he said, because I love my family. And I explained to him that as missionaries, we leave, even though we love our family so much, we were able to leave our families. We know the sacrifice is so important. And I know as, we, as those members out there sacrifice, they're able to receive so many blessings. So this recent convert, he got his act together. He came back to church, got the Melchizedek priesthood, and later was able to go to the temple with his family. I know many different individuals who have been like that, who have been able to sacrifice so much. It requires a lot of sacrifice to serve in the Cambodia Phnom Penh mission. You, the environment is rather rough. You have to deal with a lot of different rough cultural issues. 
you have to deal with a place that's very poor, that's very uh, outdated, rather behind the times, but you will enjoy it very much. At first, the first few transfers, I thought, how will I ever be able to survive through this? But after I got used to it, I grew to love it so much. I loved my mission so much. So, with the city of Phnom Penh, it's a rather exciting place. Rather, there's a lot of, it's very upbeat, it's very crazy. Like I, like I said before, it is organized chaos. So the traffic is crazy, the food is crazy, but the people are wonderful. And so some people enjoy serving in the city. They think it's like a very upbeat, lively place, but many people enjoy serving out in the countryside or in the provinces where the people are even more friendly, where the people are rather laid back. They're very welcoming. And I remember one boy in particular. So this village I served in, it was maybe about eight miles away from the church, and these people were so poor. They usually had to borrow bikes in order to get to church, and they... But they always made it to church, even though they were recent converts, they were new in the gospel, that they had a strong testimony. But there was one member in this group, he, he, was, he wasn't actually a member yet, he was this little boy that was maybe 12 or 13 years old, and he had been learning for two years, but he was never able to be baptized because his parents didn't let him. His parents didn't have any interest in the church, and by then we had a mission rule that we could only baptize children only if the parents were learning too. So we told him to fast and pray about this, and he did. He did that. He was always coming to church after two years, even though he wasn't even a member. And eventually one day, his mom decided to learn. We taught her the first lesson, committed her to be baptized, and she was a wonderful golden investigator after that. And I remember the, the Saturday when both of those two people got baptized. It's wonderful when you see the transformation in the lives of these people. When you could see people who are addicted to smoking or drinking give those things up. They're able to sacrifice these things because they know that the gospel of Jesus Christ will be able to bring them all of these blessings. The mission is a spiritual, physical, emotional, and intellectual workout. It was harder than anything I've ever done before. But it am so worth for everything that I did on my mission. I have no regrets. I am so happy that I was able to serve a mission. Cambodia is a kingdom of wonders. It is a place where you, if you are an elder, are able to use your priesthood. And, are, and if you are an elder and you are worthy, you can have the power of God. If you have faith and obedience, you will be able to do a lot of priesthood ordinances. And while I was there, I actually saw a lot of miracles. Not just in the transformation of the lives of people, but actually in the case of people being healed. People have miracles fall upon them because of their faith. It is an absolutely wonderful place to be. I will, though, I will say, though, that Cambodia is a very, very, very hard place to serve. Even though you have a lot of people to teach, even though you may have a lot of baptisms, you will have a lot of other challenges that will become paramount in your life because of the nature of the environment you're in, because you're in Cambodia. But it is so fun. After a while, you get used to it. You get used to working long, hard hours. You need to be able to get used to working very hard. You have to be able to get your testimony strengthened. Because if you don't have a testimony, you won't be able to make it. My testimony kept me going. Even though I may have had hard times with different challenging companions or even good companions or with challenging investigators or other challenging situations, my testimony was able to keep me going. If you have a strong testimony and if you're able to sacrifice and consecrate your time and your efforts to the Lord, the Lord will be able to take you through this experience and it will be for your good. Make sure you study DNC 121. So you're able to know what Joseph Smith or other people like Job went through. So you're able to know what suffering is like. Because on a mission, honestly, we suffer a lot. But we find true happiness. Not just the type of happiness that will come and go, but happiness that can be obtained that will help us in the eternities. I am so grateful for my mission. I sincerely hope that you're able to serve an honorable full-time mission that will be filled with joy and happiness. I know this gospel is true. I know God sent his son Jesus Christ to atone for us and that he loves us more than we can possibly comprehend. I know that we are led today by a living and loving prophet 
Thomas S. Monson, so we are able to know the way of truth and salvation. I know families can be together forever, and I am so grateful for my mission. It was able to teach me a lot of good principles and values that I will be able to teach my own family in the future. And I want you to know that your mission will be able to change you. Hopefully it will change you from within and make you a new person and able to change you into a son or daughter of God that will be able to lead a wonderful family one day, not just in this life, but also in the eternities. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I thought that like it would be not really surprising because you know Cambodia is like one of Asian countries and I'm from Asia so you know like for kind of weather wise like I thought that like it would be kind of similar like but it was different <laughs> it was obviously different like the airport was really small and um, when we like got out of the airport like outside of the airport like there were a lot of people already and like we just like heard like native kumai everywhere and like it was like wow that sounds like i don't understand anything but it was really exciting and senior couple missionaries actually helped us to get to get back to mission home i mean mission office um from the airport and yeah and we had we stayed in the at the mission home the first night and we had this several like orientations and meetings like um with the mission president and his wife and other office elders like who were helping us and um yeah i actually didn't have like any opportunity actually going out to proselyte that day like which like probably like you know a lot of missionaries like have done that like during their first day but my first day of proselyting is really like after I got my trainer and I moved to actual my area and yeah but it was a really exciting moment and yeah I still remember that I, I can remember that pretty clearly <laughs> still like makes me really excited about that country and like I could feel like how Heavenly Father loved the people there in that country and like how much expectation actually he had to that country and he has still. <laughs> My first area was some, like the place called Chumgamon. It's pretty like kind of center, near the center of Phnom Penh and we had a lot of people and like and my second area was Staminje. It's still also in Phnom Penh. My first four, yeah, four areas, no, three areas were all in Phnom Penh. And um, so Staminje was kind of, no, kind of a little bit far away from the center of Phnom Penh, but it's still a really nice area. But we actually had like kind of more poor people living around that area too. But we had a lot of miracles in the area that's my favorite <laughs> and um afterward i transferred to pojuntan which is which was pretty near to the airport like it, actually the airport like itself was in our area so like the area was really huge and like but we didn't have a lot of missionaries like serving at one time so like we were just like biking around <laughs> then like afterward i transferred to Badenbon, which is like one of the province areas in our missions and i spent there um my mission like six months of my mission there and i heard a lot of like great things about that area like the mi members were really strong and um they had a lot of investigators there too and they're like progressing a lot and and I really enjoyed serving that area too and we didn't have any stoplight in that area by the way it was a like, really province and like sometimes like I biked like 40 minutes or like about an hour to meet with investigators like that were re that was really big area too then like I went back to Phnom Penh the it was my last area called Tak Lak and um that area was like a little bit like far away from the center of Phnom Penh but it was still pretty big area and 
Yeah, like the members there, like we had like quite a lot of members. Well, not a lot, but like we have quite a good number of members like there too. Like a lot, they have like, well, their living standards were like, you know, quite different even like in the branch, but like they were really loving and yeah, a lot of like overall like in all areas like I know that's like it's probably like in any other missions too so but um people were like having a lot of struggles in you know especially in Cambodia because it's still you know kind of developing country and a lot of members investigators and other people we met like most of them were really like struggling like like financially and um also you know like have like some other like you know problems like with like family and other people but yeah but i really yeah i really love loved all of areas like i know that like i had like a lot of like different kind of like trials and like difficulties like in each area that's like it's just like so great to see that a lot of like small miracles every day like like whenever like we have like this um struggling and like tired and like really like hard day and like for example like all of our appointments just like you know fell through <laughs> and like oh we don't know who to meet like we're in contact but like heavenly father always like always really like guided us like to you know to be led to the people like who needed to meet us like i remember that when i was in my last area like tak -a -a, um we had this like so in cambodia we teach the english class well i didn't teach like it's not my native language but my my companion was teaching so like it was usually like at night but um we had our like meeting like before the actual class so we needed to be at the church at certain time then like on the way going there my bike got flat tire and like i got really frustrated because like we were all already kind of running late and like i felt really bad because like my companion was there and like you know whole district or like almost like yeah whole district or districts like member i mean missionaries like were at the church already and like no i feel so bad i just like didn't want to make like anything bad happening <laughs> like you know during the day but but i couldn't do anything else so we went to this like bike repair place like we have a lot of like bike like fixing like repairing places like and we actually had one in front like next to uh, literally like next to the church building so like we decided to go there like to fix my bike <laughs> so uh we went there and like i was still kind of fe like feeling really frustrated and, like i i said like oh, i'm so sorry sister like it was it shouldn't be this way and, like i wasn't planning this happening but while this like um my bike got fixed um this one school girl i think she's yeah she was a a college girl like stopped by to put air in her tire um so we decided to contact to her but well when i was about like talking to her she actually talked to us and like she said like hi how are you doing so like we started kind of having conversations and um and we introduced ourselves like that's like yeah we are missionaries like from the church actually next there like over there like have you seen that like big like white building like yeah we are from that church like have you like like so it, have you seen it and like she said like oh you two are from that building like that church like i'm actually like i i've seen the people like kind of gathering and having some activities like there several times and like i always like wanted to be in that building and but i didn't know how to get in there and like wow sure like you can come with us <laughs> so um this girl she was really interested in like knowing more about the church and like 
soon after like well she was from another area in the like same zone but like so um we actually gave that referral to other missionaries but soon after like she started like um having lessons with other sisters and she actually got baptized later and like i was just like so amazed like well that day like you know since that day that's like how heavenly father actually like made my weakness and like you know my kind of struggle like to actually the miracle and like I, we my companion and, and i were like meant to be there at the time like on that day like and like that's why we had my like you know my back tire like flat <laughs> and like it was like really kind of frustrating and like at the same time it's really kind of miserable and <laughs> like at first but it really turned to be a great like experience and a great opportunity to see like how really like god like does his work like he never like waste any moment like if we seek to follow him and like you know seek to serve him and others that's like one of the experiences like i remember about just like how he led us and how he led me and like he used me like such me and <laughs> like yeah i believe that probably other like american sisters could advise much better than me but um because i was really not thinking a lot about putting makeup if you well you still can put makeup but it will probably uh it will be off because of we, you will get really sweaty and it will rain a lot and yeah <laughs> it's kind of time consuming sometimes but we usually bike a lot so we always always wear like sp like spandex like so like it would help a lot and it will be really helpful if you can get them before going to cambodia you can get some back in Cam like some in cambodia but it's really cheap Therefore, it's really kind of easy to like, you know, kind of get bad. <laughs> so that's one thing. And I found out that like um, people there really, I know that in in the US or, you know, many other kind of developed countries, like wearing, you know, suit or like wearing skirt, like in like daily base, like it's not really kind of weird or, you know, it's kind of for some a lot of people it's probably kind of normal you know when you go to work you probably wear skirts and like you know you kind of put like more professional clothes because you're teaching or you know you're working at the office but um i found that um when you are in cambodia when you wear your missionary attire people recognize you different or as special like because they clothe kind of differently i know that's probably some people wear really professional like clothes but like a lot of people like uh, the missionaries like teach um they don't wear those kind of church clothes like skirt like as daily base basis so it's helped me a lot like during my mission that like remembering like that i'm wearing like mis the missionary attire that um the people actually look me kind of different or like um so it's kind of reminded me uh, that i needed to behave really as a missionary and yeah you can get skirts and other clothes there and yeah they're pretty cheap <laughs> yeah there are quite a lot of like differences and like some similarities too well speaking of food like i think it's quite it's not like the same obviously but it's it's similar like they cambodian people actually eat a lot of fish 
and well Japanese people eat a lot of fish too so it was really kind of it was actually easy for easier for me I think like to adjust like Cambodian like this kind of like cuisine or Cambodian like eating culture because like their main like well they mainly eat rice and like you know in Japan it's the same and I know that some of my companions like American companions like were kind of struggling like you know having like rice like every day <laughs> and but I loved it <laughs> and but I think that people were really different I think like the living style our living styles are quite different I believe um because I think that Cambodian people are more kind of open to their neighbors and like they always so they have like their houses like having well if they have like kind of quite nice nice houses like they have this kind of gate gates like in front of their houses and like they usually open it like when they are whenever they are at home and so that like, they can welcome actually neighbors and like other people coming in and like I have like a lot of experiences that's like those like people like we were contacting that you know they just like welcome to us and like oh yeah you can come in and sit <laughs> and like have a seat there like we can chat and like that's really nice and but yeah it, it will be really hard back in Japan too like because like people are really like busy and like they have they have their kind of individual lives like I know that they still have like this kind of community like you know and like connection with when like people in neighbor but that will be probably pretty different and yeah like both of like them have like kind of like bigger religious background as Buddhism but they have different like you know different kinds of Buddhism like in Cambodia and like in Japan and like in Japan like it's more kind of Buddhism like it's becoming like really more culture like oh yeah it's kind of like tradition like it's really like Japanese like kind of cultural religion I don't know how to say it but um but in Cambodia like still a lot of people like over 90 percent of like actually like population is Buddhist and they're actually like observing it like really well like they like a lot of people still like go to like the, their Buddhism temples and like you know they celebrate like their kind of Buddhist kind of holidays and celebrations like kind of more strictly than what Japanese people do so that that was the difference too. It was actually really interesting experience. It was not easy to learn Cambodian, like learn Kumai through English, which was my second language. When I was in the DC, my companion made this card said, you know how people say that like like Spanish and English as like you know Spanglish. And so my companion decided to make this small card saying like I speak Japak Manglish. <laughs> it's like which is like Japanese Kumai and English. And <laughs> I think it was really funny. But the this is something I didn't notice like until recently. Uh, until recent I guess. But um recently I found that actually Kumai grammar, like Kumai language style, is kind of combination of English grammar and Japanese grammar. It's like more like English grammar, but some like grammatical rules and like some specific things like are really similar to how Japanese like has it in its grammar. And it was really interesting to find. But this was not easy. Like I was really struggling a lot with language, especially the pronunciation. I'm actually still struggling with that a lot. But um, because we were learning Kumai pronunciation through English pronunciation, so like this this sound would be this sound in English. But like I didn't pronounce that English sound like kind of accurately either. So it was kind of struggling. Like it was really big struggle for me that I I remember that I asked 
a lot of a lot of questions at the MTC and like during my mission too. Um, but it was really faith strengthening experience that I don't know how Heavenly Father decided to call me to serve in Cambodia because it definitely would be easier. Well, yeah, like less trouble <laughs> to send me somewhere, you know, using like either Japanese or English because it's definitely easier. But Heavenly Father probably didn't give up on me. <laughs> he put more challenge, <laughs> but it definitely like his plan because I couldn't have such like experiences like without going to Cambodia. And like I didn't have this like understanding and like learning more in my life without going there. I sometimes like felt that feel that like I probably should have more faith in it, but that was probably my best at the time. Like it's really normal that um having like struggles like to have faith in learning new language and I definitely have had that but that's okay too <laughs> and I feel that um, but Heavenly Father really helped me a lot as I learned Khmer and because <laughs> I was probably kind of stubborn I didn't really want to excuse about my language because because of my like learning a third language because it didn't make a lot of difference like you just need to learn that language and like as long as like you know because like I was called to serve in that language so like I should be able to receive the guidance and support to learn that language if I you know work if I worked hard it was still amazing that how I actually like ended up like speaking Kumai <laughs> I still don't understand a lot of part of his plan but he really works miracle <laughs> because I definitely wouldn't be able to learn that language by myself it was like really challenging but this was really the gift of the tongue that he gave to me and I know that I need to keep working on that <laughs> even after my mission <laughs> I actually got really sick in my last three weeks and I couldn't press light a lot it was really frustrating and I was stressed out I felt bad about my companions and other missionaries and investigators that I was helping but like because I couldn't go out and but it was like everyone was just like so nice and kind to me and like they supported me, they helped me and um, those like and senior couple missionaries supported me too and they were so loving and patient and um, and there was one point that I just like I was still really sick and like, I was in bed and I just like felt that like I was so inadequate to receive this whole blessings that I've been I had been receiving like during that period from others and from even from investigators because like I didn't do anything like I couldn't do anything I just like pray and like you know study the scriptures and like I I needed to take a rest and like but otherwise like I couldn't press light I couldn't teach the lessons I couldn't find people and like I couldn't help other missionaries and so like I just like felt I was just wondering like why I could receive like this many blessings like because like I didn't do anything Heavenly Father like I, I, I'm so inadequate like I'm not really like you know fit in this blessing it's just like almost like too much to receive because I didn't do anything <laughs> but um then like I prayed about it and I just like strongly like felt that's like how 
the atonement of Jesus Christ actually filled this gap that I had between Heavenly Father and me and how how just like that I I really like could receive all of the blessing and like the Spirit told me that's like like hesitating receiving these blessings will be actually prideful <laughs> and yes it was because like that's me that meant like I didn't um really believe in I don't know probably I didn't understand but like I didn't really you know trust in the atonement of Jesus Christ and like how it could make everything possible <laughs> and so that was I I think that was the biggest life lesson that whenever I feel inadequate I still feel that almost every day and like you know in my daily life but uh, whatever situation I had I I still can I will be okay because the atonement of Jesus Christ will be with me as long as I follow him and yeah I trust in him so this sister she has been she had been less active for a while and her husband wasn't a member and we actually went to visit her pretty often I, I think at least once a week I think and we visited her shared the message and she liked to see us but she she didn't you know she wasn't really determined to come to the church and we were kind of struggling kind of finding the way that we can help her better and one Sunday before the church because like we had the church um, in the afternoon like we had some time to proselyte beforehand um, we decided to go to invite her to come to the church with us <laughs> before the church so we went there <laughs> and but it was not the best day like weather wise and the sister wasn't feeling really kind of not not physically well but like i think like she wasn't not really like totally happy to be with us on that day well we talked with her and we shared a message with her and as like we kind of invited her to come to the church it started raining outside and like it would be a great excuse for her not coming to the church and she's just like yeah I wouldn't go to the church it started raining outside and like my companion I and I had no idea what to do but uh, we decided to just like sing a hymn before we leave and we'll see what would go on so like it was really hard like um, we sang this um, the Spirit of God and the rain was really hard and it was really loud because her house had like this like tin roof so like it was pounding the, on the tin roof and like it sounds really loud <laughs> like it sounded really loud and like we were just like singing really loud too but um after we sang uh, it was still raining but um we asked her like sister will you come to the church if it stops raining and she was kind of like struggling answering us but like she was like mm, i i will think about that <laughs> so um we decided to you know pray and when we finished praying and we needed to leave because we had another appointment but like when we like went outside it, it wasn't raining anymore and and we saw we saw her and like sister it's not raining anymore do you think you can come to the church this afternoon and she said okay I would go so she came to the church that day she stayed at the church and because she had been a member for a while she obviously had a lot of members actually know 
her, you know, who knew, who knew her. So like they welcomed her and yeah, it was, it was a miracle. <laughs> like, it was like one of my favorite <laughs> experiences <laughs> that I had with like less active members. Yeah. So I know that serving Cambodia is one of your the best experience that experiences that you will have. I love Cambodia and I love Cambodian people. They are so loving and so humble. They will they will receive your messages and they will they will love you and you will love them. Whenever you feel frustrated with your language, with your environment, with your, um, I don't know, like missionaries work, please just remember that Heavenly Father has called you in that specific country which has so many children of God who has this great Christ-like attributes. They will be great example for you and that way I believe that you and them they will be edified and will be supported each other and I know that Cambodia is a special place for Heavenly Father. I, I know that you will see a lot of miracles when you put your best effort to serve Him and serve the people there. And I know that the Atonement of Jesus Christ will make everything possible when you trust Him in His work. So the Cambodia Phnom Penh mission is, uh, covers the countries of Cambodia and Vietnam. Um, we do have missionaries that are serving in Vietnam, the Vietnamese speaking missionaries. Um, currently we're only sending missionaries with Vietnamese heritage, um, Vietnamese parentage over to Vietnam. Um, and they're not allowed to proselyte um, openly on the streets, but they, they are very key and, and we're building up branches there. We, we currently have three branches in Vietnam, two in Ho Chi Minh, and one in Hanoi. Um, and um, in Cambodia, we've got most of the branches um, are in the, city, the capital city of Phnom Penh, um, where we've got 18 branches, I think. Well, not all of them are branches anymore. Um, I'm used to calling them branches, but right before I left, um, we actually created the first two stakes in Cambodia, uh, and uh, that was the week before I finished my mission. Elder Gong from the 70 came, uh, he's the Asia Area President, and he came and we uh, created the formed the first two stakes in Cambodia and Phnom Penh in the Phnom Penh North Stake and the Phnom Penh South Stake, and that was really great to see um, that historical event. At the same time, just the weekend before, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the church officially being recognized and officially being allowed to proselyte and, and be active in Cambodia. And so, you know, in 20 years we got two stakes and that's a pretty major accomplishment and there's more on the way. Um, outside of Phnom Penh, we've got, um, it used to be four, we've now got six um, provinces open. We've got the province of Badambong, Siem Reap, Kampung Tom, and Kampung Jam. And now we've just opened up new groups in the provinces of Boasat and Brave Wang. Um, Badambong has uh, got three branches. Um, I served in Badambong. I served in the first branch of Badambong when it was back before it was when it was just two branches um, and then they split it while I was there into the Stungs and Kai and uh, I end up by making that branches um, and uh, Radamong has been a wonderful place for the church to be and it's seen a lot of growth um, we've got a beautiful 
chapel building in Badenbong that's right off the main highway. So everybody who comes into Badenbong sees our church building and it's a um, wonderful place. My favorite place, probably my favorite place in the country is in Badenbong. It's just a beautiful area, um, wonderful people there that, you know, I, every Cambodian that I've ever met is big hearted, but in Badenbong they're just even more than that. So, um, Badawong's great. Uh, Siem Reap, they recently split into two branches. So they've got two branches in Siem Reap now. And so um, hopefully soon, as the church continues to grow in Badawong and Siem Reap, they'll be able to make a, a stake with Badawong and Siem Reap because um, it requires five units to be able to create a stake. And so Badawong and Siem Reap now have the right number of units. Hopefully they'll get the priesthood leadership that they need um, in order to be able to Soon they'll be able to create a stake there. Um, Gumpung Tom is uh, what before it was the smallest province we were in. Um, we had just two companionships there, only just one branch. Um, and just this past year, and you know, just a couple months ago, they dedicated the first actual church chapel, um, the, the church owned building. Um, before we had a rental building that we were using, but now we've actually got a chapel dedicated in Kapung Tom. And um, over the last eight months, we've had the first sisters that were able to serve in Kapung Tom before we only had elders. And so we're seeing some growth in Kapung Tom as well. Um, and it's exciting to see that. Um, Kapung Jam, we've got three branches and then a group. Um, so in the province of Kampung Jam, there's the city of Kampung Jam, and we have three branches based in the city and the outskirts of the city. And then um, a little bit away from the main city, there's a place called Bre Cho, um, which is kind of another little district inside of the province. And we've had members that have been coming in all the way from Brecho to come into Kabung Jam every week um, to be able to come to church. They've got a big long trailer that they bring in every single week to get able to get to church. And luckily we've now been able to create a group out there so that they're having their own worship services out in Brecho and only kind of having to come in once a month um, to hopefully strengthen that uh, area of the church in Brecho and hopefully we'll be able to get a branch there. Um, and help that to grow and with that and the three branches in Kabung Jam, we'd be, then be able to create a stake there with Kabung Jam and Kabung Tom. Um, I served in Kabung Jam as well. I served in the second branch of Kabung Jam and another wonderful place. It's right along the Mekong River um, and yeah, beautiful place. Lots of farmers. Um, one of the places that I was able to go to in Kapung Cham is there's an island and it's kind of a touristy island because to get out to the island you ride across a bamboo bridge that they rebuild every year because the floods of the Mekong come and just wash the bridge away and so every year they rebuild this bamboo bridge so you can cross to get to the island. Um, and then, like I said, we just opened up two new districts in Brebueng and in Boasat. Um, so we've got two new provinces there that we're starting the missionary work, getting going, and that's really exciting. Um, a lot of members in Phnom Penh have family that live in Brebueng province, and so now they have the opportunity here. And a lot of members from Badambong have family in Boasat because Boasat is right next to Badambong, and so being able to get you know, those touch with those family members there has been a really great thing. Um, we also have a Vietnamese uh, district in uh, Phnom Penh. There's three Vietnamese branches there in the central district. Um, and then the east district of Phnom Penh, um, where we've got uh, the city of Dak Mau and then kind of the suburb of Phnom Penh that's called Gien's Phi are in the East District and they're growing pretty well too. So we're excited for all the growth that's happening. First day we got to Cambodia. Um, we, we came in and landed in the airport, got off the plane, um, you know, we're walking through and there's all these Cambodian people were 
we spent 12 weeks in the MTC trying to learn Cambodian and we're excited to try and learn it, try and use it, but we're also really nervous because we know we won't be able to understand if they talk back to us. Um, and so we're going through the airport. Um, it's a really small airport, so it's really quick to get it out and get our luggage and everything. We got out and there was no one there. <laughs> we got out of the airport and we're standing outside of the terminal and looking around and there's no one there for us. I mean, we've got a group of 15 people just standing around with a bunch of luggage, like looking around, okay, what do we do now? Do we all go talk to the, the Duk Duk? So, the, so there's a the kind of common transportation is called the Duk Duk. Um, and it's a, it's a motorcycle with a carriage trailer um, that you can ride in the carriage. Um, and so we, like, so do we, like, grab a taxi or a tuk tuk and take it to the mission home? I mean, we got the mission home address, I guess, from from the mailing address information. Um, and so as we were kind of sitting there, then the president and the APs came up and they're like, how'd you get out of the airport so fast? No, no one's ever beaten us out of the airport. Um, and they came up and took us out. And the very first thing we did is we went to a market. It's called San Orduseli. Um, it's kind of over in the area by the mission home. And we went out there and we started contacting. They had the assistants and the office elders there with us and split us up. And we went one with the office elder or an assistant and one and then one of us. And we just went out and started contacting people. Um, that was really intimidating <laughs> but it was a lot of fun it was really really cool experience um i remember the first not not the first guy one of the guys that i talked to uh he was an older gentleman and he wasn't really interested at all i was trying to talk to him ask him if he'd ever learned about jesus christ asked him if he'd uh, ever gone to a church and he, he talked about some church that he'd gone to um but he said he wasn't really interested and so we started walking away as we started walking away, like he called out to us, and he's like, "Hey, do you have anything I could? I'll just I'll just start handing out some stuff. Help you guys hand out some information and stuff." And so we gave him a stack of pass along cards with our phone number on, and and he was starting to hand them around to people around, and it was it was a really cool experience just to see, you know, he does he doesn't want our message. He's not interested, but he's willing to give it and pass it along to other people. So it was a really cool and interesting experience. Um, and then, uh, it was a really great moment for me when we, uh, we are able to go contact these three young men who were sitting in one of those duk duks, um, and we, uh, got in the duk duk with them and sat down with them and we started talking with them. And our goal with that was we wanted to give them a Book of Mormon. And so... Um, you know, I was doing the talking and saying, here, this is the Book of Mormon. And in the end, they were, they accepted the Book of Mormon. And I was like, yes, we got the Book of Mormon out. And, um, then we went back to the mission home and we had a lot of orientation and stuff. Um, met the mission president, got to really know him pretty well. Um, President Moon was great. And, um, had some more orientation stuff, got to bed. Had some trouble sleeping with the jet lag, and the schedule was completely off. But we got, we got tired enough that we were able to sleep. Um, and the next day was get transfers with your trainer and go. Um, and so we just went. Um, and that first night with my trainer, we went and we met with the branch president. And... I didn't add much of anything to that meeting at all, but I was able to, I was there and I was really surprised that I was able to understand what they were talking about. I mean, they were talking about things that I had never talked about before at the MTC, but, um, yeah, I mean, they were talking about less active members and things and I had never talked about that, but I was able to kind of follow along in that meeting and it's actually a really, really good meeting. Um, I really got to know my branch president well and as we went over throughout the week as we went and visited members and got to know the members it was really great to see how warm and friendly they were and how willing they were to reach out to all of us i mean even though we were just 
I was just this new missionary and my trainer was new to the area as well. We were we were what's called whitewashing where both of us, neither of us knew the area and we were coming in to serve in the area and um it was a it was a really great place. It was a really humbling experience. Um that first week I I started out in an area that's called Stung Min Che. Um and specifically in the third branch of Stung Min Che. Um where probably a third of the geographical area of the branch is taken up by big uh, dump. It's it's no longer an active dump. It was a previous dump. Um, and there's all sorts of slums that have popped up and around the dump as people um, use it to have cheap land and to, um, they would go through and collect recyclables, things that people had thrown away that were recyclable. They would dig through the trash of the dump and find those recyclables. Um, and that's how they made their living. And, you know, so I was coming from America straight into a dump, basically, and that's where I was serving and um, really just serving and loving these people so much and just seeing that they have the biggest hearts and that they love you so much. I mean, it's, it's a feeling that you can't compare to and the feeling that you love them so much as well. And it's not, oh, I pity you because you're so poor. It's, I love you because you're such an amazing person and I want to get to know you. Um, that's That was the best feeling and that was kind of my first impression as I got into the country. You know, you learn a lot about conversion on a mission um, and uh, there's a lot that you learn from from other watching other and helping other people's conversion but there's a lot that you learn from your own conversion as well um, and um, for me everything in my mission comes back to the missionary purpose which is to invite others to come unto Christ by helping them receive their restored gospel through faith in Jesus Christ and His atonement, repentance, baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. Um, uh, the missionary purpose is for us to help other people, invite and help other people to live the doctrine of Christ. Um, and for me, um, learning about and applying the doctrine of Christ was really what my mission was all about. Um, learning about it for myself and really understanding what the doctrine of Christ means, what it means to have faith and repent and be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and endure to the end and how those, how essential and basic and fundamental those principles and ordinances are. And as well as helping other people to receive those, to change their lives in order that they could come into Christ. Um, you know, it, it starts from day one and goes to the end of your mission where you're, you're spending all your time doing that. Um, uh, there's a lot of people um, that I was able to help and, and watch as they were coming into Christ. One thing that's really key is that families are central to the gospel. And that means that we're always striving to bring families into the gospel and not just individuals. Um, one of the problems that we face is that a lot of um, members are, are single and unconnected really to the gospel. Um, by any sort of actual relationship and so it's really important to have families and have that strong family unit um, together united that can bring that stability we love our we love our young single adult members and they provide all sorts of help for us um, both as missionaries and just serving in the church it's amazing the work that the young single adults do as they fulfill all these callings um, it's it's really quite remarkable how effective the young single adult members of the church are 
Um, but we really need families in the church. Um, and so uh, that was always something that I tried to emphasize is, is inviting families to learn about the gospel together. We had one in Badenbaum. Um, there was a recent convert when I came into the area that had just been baptized a couple of weeks before I got there. Um, and uh, we were teaching her as a recent convert, trying to strengthen her and make sure that she was had a good solid handle of the doctrine and that she was continuing to progress in, in her application of the doctrine. And um, as we were... Um, teaching her as a recent convert. Um, uh, one day, the assistant who had been the one that had been the missionary who had taught her and, and helped her get to baptism came through and came on exchange with us. And um, we were able to teach her a lesson that day. And she told us that day that uh, her sister was, her parents had given permission for her sister to learn. And so we talked to her and we said, all right, that'd be great. We'd love to be able to teach your sister. When can we come by your house? Um, because up to that point, we'd always taught her at the church. We'd never been to her house. So I said, when can we come by your house to visit your family and maybe start teaching her sister? Um, because we knew, we knew we would be able to get the parents too, not just the sister. If the parents are given permission, we'll get them. Um, and so we went and we were able to stop by and visit with them and talk to them a little bit um, and we were able to meet the, uh, the mother and the daughter that first night that we went um, and just share with a little bit with them and invited the mother to learn as well to join in on the lessons and she wholeheartedly agreed to that and we started teaching them a little bit and you know, after uh, a lesson or two we asked, you know, what about dad? Where, where's dad? Can we, then, can we start teaching dad? And they said, ah, he works often, but you could you could probably catch him during the daytime. He usually comes home for lunch. You could probably catch him for a few minutes in the, during the daytime. So we started going and visiting them during the day so we could um, teach the parents together. And we would invite um, the daughters to come in as often as they could. Um, the, the younger sister, who, who wasn't a member yet, um, was busy with high school and didn't seem all that interested in learning with us um, on a continuing basis, but we continued teaching with the teaching the parents, and they were just on fire. They were absolutely amazing. Um, as they, we invited them to start coming to church. They started coming to church. Um, the father um, occasionally drank and was a smoker. We taught him about the word of wisdom, and he just quit cold turkey and never looked back. Um, and, you know, we started coming to church. Everything was going great. They just had an amazing faith that they were able to develop. And um, their daughter lagged behind. Um, so we, we went ahead and, and with the parents, they were ready. So we decided we, we would go ahead and, and proceed with their baptism. And they got baptized. Um, and... Um, after that, we had a transfer, and my companion left, and I got a new companion, and I was training, and so my new companion knew some Kamai, he didn't know a lot of Kamai, he knew a lot of Kamai for a new missionary, but, um, he wasn't as good as my native Kamai companion that I had had before, and so, um, I was a little worried about this family and, and how we were going to help continuing to strengthen them. And the daughter was really resistant. Um, we would we kept trying to meet with her, and we she would meet with us still. She was she was polite and listened to us, but really just no progress at all with the daughter. We would ask her to pray, she wouldn't pray. We would ask her to read the Book of Mormon, she wouldn't read the Book of Mormon. We'd ask her to come to church. There was no way she was coming to church. Um, but we kept working with her, and it got to the point that the mom said, you know what, you might as well just not even bother coming and trying to teach my daughter anymore. She's she's just not interested. She's not going to believe in what you have to teach. And we said, no, we think everybody deserves a chance. And so we we were really determined that we would be able to have a chance to continue meeting with her. 
and um, we prayed for that opportunity. Um, she had blown us off a couple of times. She was busy with other things. Um, and one day, you know, almost like after we had almost given up on her because she was, she seemed like she was done. She seemed like she wasn't going to let us back in anymore. Um, we had tried a couple of things that our appointments had fallen through. We tried a couple of backup plans and they weren't working out. And so we said, you know what, we might as well try calling her up and seeing if we could meet with her right now. And she said, uh, yeah, why not? You guys can come over. That day she actually had a cold. Um, so she probably just wasn't feeling up to fighting. I don't know. <laughs> um, but um, we went over. We were able to share a lesson with her. And as we had that lesson with her, um, the way we we were thinking about her and teaching to her was different. Instead of teaching to her as the sister of the recent convert and as the daughter of the parents, we were teaching her as herself and started thinking about, you know, we love you as a daughter of Christ and you as uh, a daughter of God and you need to hear this message and understand this so that you can live a happy life. And as we, we kind of changed our, our mindset, changed our thinking there, um, we had a really great lesson with her, but it kind of felt just the same as any of the other great lessons that we'd had with her and we left and we didn't think much of it. Uh, it turns out that, however, that night she was struggling with her cold. She was really having trouble. She woke up in the middle of the night and couldn't get back to sleep. And so she was trying to do the things that she would normally do if she was having trouble getting to sleep. She got up, she kind of had a midnight snack, um, you know, kind of cleaned up, tried to do whatever she could to try and get back to sleep, but nothing was working. Nothing was working at all, and as she was struggling with this, she kind of had this thought, you know what, I could pray. And she's, mm, I might as well, it won't hurt anything. And so she prayed, and after she said her prayer that and asked for help to be able to go to sleep and to be able to get better, she went to sleep just fine. Um, woke up the next morning, went to school, didn't think anything of it, really. Um, and as she came back from school, and she was eating some lunch and watching the TV. She was sitting there watching the TV. She realized, wait a minute, I don't have a cold anymore. She had completely forgotten the fact that she'd even had a cold the night before. And she really recognized that this was a miracle um, for her. Um, she was able to uh, really catch on to the idea that this was a miracle that uh, Heavenly Father had given to her because of her exercise of faith to pray. Um, even when she didn't really know, even when she didn't really believe, she had that exercise of faith to pray, and she got a miracle because of it. And from then on, it was just a matter of making sure everything got taught, making sure she came to church, and she was great. She went good to go. She had a strong testimony, strong belief in the fact that God was real. She she had experienced it firsthand. Um, and so we got the entire family and um, unfortunately they're struggling a little bit right now. Um, that's what happens in people's lives. They become converted and then they have some trials and we try to do our best to help them when they have those trials and some people far out fall away farther than others but I guess they're just like any of us that we have times when we're better and times when we're worse and so um, I keep in touch with them I keep trying to encourage them and they're doing they're doing well um, there's a lot of love for that family so in Kabong Jam there, I was there during the flood season. So in Cambodia, um, they have a rainy season and a dry season. And in about October, yeah, about October, beginning of October, end of September, beginning of October, it becomes the flood season because the monsoons are so hard um, and there's just not enough time to drain all the water away. And so they start getting the floods built up. 
And so it was flood season in Kapung Jam, and I just transferred into the area, um, taken over for a great missionary, and he had done really good work with um, one family and getting a father uh, who was ready to be baptized. And the other members of the family were a little bit more reticent and hadn't really been converted yet, um, but we were being able to start teaching the mother. And so we were there pretty often, you know, teaching the father some days, teaching the mother some days. Um, and it was flood season, and so the floods came up and they uh, flooded out the neighbor's house. So the neighbors um, came over and, and um, invited, they were invited over to live with this, this member house. Um, and, you know, that started being a little bit of a problem because every time we would go in out on the front porch they were out there playing cards and drinking beer and it's a little bit disruptive um, but we would invite them you know hey if you guys want to come in and, and listen for a little bit they were, were they were welcome to um, we found out that one of the neighbors had actually um, she had a really tragic story her husband left her um, but uh, she started out, um, she was before living in Phnom Penh, and as she lived in Phnom Penh, she went to a Christian church there in Phnom Penh, um, and, and really had a good faith in Christ, and so she was willing to sit in on our lessons. And she was back now in Kabong Jam living with her sister, um, and so they were the neighbors to this family. and. Their, the flood forced them in with this home, and so we started teaching them as well uh, when they probably wouldn't have accepted us had they not just been listening to us out on the front porch every day for a week or so before they decided to start taking um, and sitting in with lessons with us for real. Um, and so we started teaching them, and they both had really hard lives, really hard stories. The, the older sister, um, her husband had passed away, and um, she was really heartbroken over that. She was really grieving over that. Um, the younger sister, her husband had actually ran off with another woman, leaving her the caretaker of five, yeah, five, four, four children, four children. Um, and she was trying to do anything that she could to make ends meet. She was working in a, a KTV, which is a, it's a club. Um, place serving as a, a waitress there um, just to try and make ends meet and so uh, you know her children would go off to school during the day and at night she would go off and, and work in the KTV um, and it was just a really hard lifestyle for her, um, you know with the the effects of her husband running away she was she'd become kind of an alcoholic drinking a lot and um, just not living a really good lifestyle, not being, you know, trying to provide for her children, but not being a very good mother to her children. Um, and she'd just really fallen off a lot from where she had been. And so we started teaching them. And it was just miraculous to see the change that came over her um, as we taught them and as we as we shared with them and as they started reading the Book of Mormon, as they started coming to church, the power of the atonement really worked in their lives. Um, her emotional scars, her, her hurt from her past life, from how her husband had treated her from the years of drinking, um, they started to go away. There was a new light that came into her eyes. Um, it was really special to see the atonement working in someone's life that way. To to watch her as she changed her life around, as she stopped drinking, as she even said no to drinking even at work in such a, um, a high-pressure situation where really the culture dictates that if she's a waitress and they invite her to... to um, take some of their food that she really needs to take it um, even if that includes alcohol and she just said okay I'll stop doing that 
um, as we continue to work with her and really see the atonement change not only what she did but her desires and and also to heal some of that emotional pain that she had felt um, from her husband leaving her it was just an amazing experience it was it was incredible to see the atonement work in her life um, and that was a really really powerful experience to me about what the power of the atonement can do it can it really does change people's lives well congratulations you're coming to the Cambodian Phnom Penh mission It's the best mission in the world um, I just got back um, about eight months ago from the Cambodia Phnom Penh mission and I loved every single day that I spent in the Cambodia Phnom Penh mission uh, it's got a wonderful history a wonderful area of the church that's growing quite a lot it's the in my opinion best mission in the world and in a lot of ways statistically speaking the best mission in the Asia area um, you're gonna have a lot of fun a lot of great times you're gonna be able to work hard and um, I, uh, I'm just so excited for you. Go get a map, figure out where Cambodia is if you don't know already, and just be prepared to um, come to the best mission in the world with the best people in the world. You know, if you're going to Cambodia, be prepared to get wet. <laughs> um, that, it rains a lot. It rains a lot, and you're going to get wet. So get a poncho and just love every minute of it. Um, you know, it, sometimes it, it wears on you, <laughs> all the rain it coming down every time being soaked 24-7. I mean, it can wear on you a little bit, but just enjoy it, embrace it, um, and recognize that we're just like the post office. <laughs> no matter what the weather is, we have to go out and do our work because our work's even more important than the post office. What we deliver is a lot more important than mail that people receive. What we deliver is salvation. Um, so there's one piece of advice. Go get a poncho so that you can enjoy the rain. And then the other piece of advice I would say is just to embrace Cambodia. Um, Cambodia is a very special place for me. It holds my heart. Um, and I would hope that every missionary that goes there embraces Cambodia and sees the good that Cambodia has to offer. Um, there's some things that are different. There's some things that you might think are weird or that don't make sense. Um, I, would, I would just try to give you the advice and encourage you to leave that behind you, to embrace all that Cambodia has to offer. Um, let yourself love Cambodia with everything that you have and everything that you are. Let yourself love the Cambodian people with everything that you have. And that's when you'll be successful. That's when you'll be doing the work that the Lord wants you to do because that's how the Lord thinks about it, His children. Um, sure, there's the things that they do that are different and that aren't necessarily what you want them to do um, but don't complain about those things. Forget about those things and, and see the good things and just embrace it. And you're never going to be Cambodian if you're an American. I understand that, but do your best. <laughs> do your best impersonation of a Cambodian that you can be as far as, um, taking upon you all the good things that their culture really has to offer and it's a, it's amazing what can happen with that. So the Cambodia Phnom Penh mission, it's now about 20 years old. While I was there we had our 20 year anniversary celebration which was really cool and that same year Cambodia got its first two stakes and that was a really big step. It was for Cambodia for them to have stakes and to have uh, those priesthood keys given to that country. Um, during that year, the Vietnamese government accepted the Interim Representative Board for our church to act in behalf of our church in Vietnam, which was a big step forward to helping our church get recognized. Uh, currently in Vietnam, there are missionaries in t two cities, in Hanoi and in Ho Chi Minh, 
and we have three branches. Missionary work is something kind of new to Vietnam. Back before the Vietnamese War, there were a few missionaries that were able to enter southern Vietnam and they started missionary work there and they had a growing branch and they even had a building. But after the war, the church left Vietnam and many of the members also left Vietnam. And it wasn't until about 10 years ago that the church started again in Vietnam. And at first there were no missionaries, it was just a few members meeting together. But after a while, a few locals, a few Vietnamese people, served as missionaries um, and helped bring more people into the church. Um, about a year or so before I started to serve a mission, they started to allow people uh, from America to come in to do missionary work. So it's kind of a newer thing. Uh, missionary work in Vietnam is a little bit different. It's a non-proselyting work. We uh, don't call ourselves missionaries or branch builders. We don't wear our name tags. When we're out on the streets and talking to people, we can't bring up the gospel or we can't teach out on the streets. And there's a lot of small rules that we were given um, that came from meetings that our church had with government officials. Like we weren't supposed to draw attention to ourselves and we're not supposed to give prayers in public and other things like that. But what we do is we work really closely with the members. The members understand uh, what the challenges are to missionary work and they're really ready to participate and help bring people to Christ. It's really cool. So most Vietnamese people are, uh, they don't have a religion at all. And then after the group of people who don't have a religion uh, comes the Buddhists and then there's several local Vietnamese religions that Vietnamese people follow. And there are also several branches of Christianity in Vietnam. But most people whom I had the opportunity to teach or work with, they usually came from backgrounds where they didn't have any religious um, beliefs or upbringing. Most people would worship their ancestors, but uh, that was about as far as they had ever experienced in any religious setting. So it was really, really quite amazing when we had the chance to work with people and to teach them about Christ and uh, to let them know why we believe in things that we can't see or how these, how Christ can really help them. Our usual branch attendance, um, in the branches I served in, we would have around 60 to 80 people come each week. Um, there is one branch in Ho Chi Minh that usually gets well over 100 people coming each week. So a day in the life of a missionary in Vietnam, let's, let's choose a Wednesday because Wednesdays are the busiest. Um, we would usually wake up on 6.30 and we would get ready. We would get in our three hours of study and then we'd go out. Since it's a Wednesday, we'll usually eat lunch and then take an hour to prepare for our English class that night. Um, we're encouraged to prepare for at least one hour for every English class we teach. And sometimes we'll teach one English class a week, sometimes we'll teach more. It depends on the area. But so after we've prepared for English class and we've thought of, you know, games to play and how we're going to teach vocabulary, what ways can we help our students really learn English, then we'll, we can either, if we don't have any appointments, we could go out to the parks or go um, to more crowded places and try and start conversations with people. And our goal with starting conversations with people isn't to share the gospel immediately because that's not allowed. We're trying to follow the laws of the land. Um, but we're trying to brighten people's days. We're seeing if we can give them any service, if we can help them push their cart, if we can do anything to brighten their day and 
Um, along with that, we'll see if they're interested in our English classes. Uh, we let them know that we're, we'll be teaching a free English class that night uh, at our church and that they're welcome to come. And usually that the people are really open to that because English is something that's uh, really useful to Vietnamese people in finding jobs and uh, doing well in school. So after that, usually we'll have some appointments, uh, whether it be with investigators or with recent converts or members, less active members. And most of our appointments will be at the church because we aren't, we, in the past, we weren't allowed to teach at investigators' homes. That has recently changed and now we are, as long as we have their permission. But we would teach at the church and we would have um, lessons with members and a lot of the younger members would like to hang around the church. It was kind of a cool gathering place for them where they could relate to people their age about what it's like being Christian in this non-religious country. They would gather there and they'd be really, most of them would be very ready to help us teach and they were preparing for their own missionary service. After our appointments we would have our English classes which were it would be really high energy and we'd try and have a, help everyone have fun and learn something new. Uh, then after English class we would have a small break and then invite everyone to stick around for a short gospel lesson. Um, and during the gospel lesson we would give them opportunities to continue practicing their English and share with them simple doctrines to help introduce them to our church and the reasons why we really want to share these things with them. Um, and that would be what we would do on a Wednesday. So I served from 2013 to 2015. Uh, I recently ended this last January. But I started in Hanoi and I was there for two transfers. Then I went down to Ho Chi Minh and I was there for five transfers. Then I returned to my first area in Hanoi and I was there for another three. So then I came back down to Ho Chi Minh City for another two transfers. Then I was went over to Cambodia and I was there for two transfers and then I finished in Hanoi. I spent the rest of my time there. I remember that the flight was awful. There was a typhoon in Hong Kong so our plane couldn't land and we were re-diverted to Taiwan. And we stayed in Taiwan for eight hours and we wouldn't, they wouldn't let us leave the plane. And we finally got to Phnom Penh at 11 o'clock at night, about 18 hours late or so. It was quite late and we were all really, really tired, our small group of people going to this mission. Um, but the mission president, which was President Moon, and his wife came and they picked us up. And uh, as they were driving us to the mission home from the airport, they were talking to us and getting to know us. Um, and it was then that he told me that I'd be serving in Vietnam. So someone serving in the Cambodia Phnom Penh Vietnamese program, if they are of Vietnamese descent, they can serve in Vietnam, but they can also serve in Cambodia and he told me that I'd be serving in Hanoi and it was a really cool moment for me just to know like I would be going back to my homeland, my ancestral roots um, and the next day I met my trainer, uh, Elder Duck, and he was the best missionary I ever served with. He was uh, very good, very caring and loving and I think the most important thing that was it that allowed him to help me was that he was really patient with me and I would make all kinds of mistakes and he was always ready to help me and he was patient as I was trying to work through learning a language and trying to do missionary things and talk to people and all these things that I wasn't used to doing but he was always really supportive and understanding of that. Phnom Penh is, er, when I first came to Phnom Penh, I, I remember thinking that it was kind of crazy. It was everyone was driving on the wrong side of the street, and 
And they're like kids running around naked. And I'm like, what is this place? There's a lot of culture shock. That was also when I first came to my mission when I was at the mission home before going to Hanoi. But while I was serving there, I was able to see that there was a really rich and colorful culture that was there. Um, they have a large Indian influence and celebrate things like the Ramayana and things like that. Um, Khmer language is very different from Vietnamese and it was very difficult for me to pick up enough Khmer to talk to a Khmer person and ask them if they know any Vietnamese person or if they would like to study English. Phnom Penh was the smallest city that I served in and it had a kind of a small city feel. I'm not sure if it just felt that way because I was coming from Ho Chi Minh or if it actually feels like a small city, but there's a lot of like, mom and pop shops that sell ice cream and hamburgers. And um, there's a large Western influence on the city, a lot of foreign investors to that city and a lot of expats who live there. And it's, it's a kind of, um, it's a really intriguing mix of West and East and um, East Asian and South Asian it all gets combined into Phnom Penh. In Phnom Penh there is a large Vietnamese population. A lot of them were war refugees and they've been living there for about 40 years now and they've established you know areas of the city where there's large pockets of Vietnamese people. The Vietnamese people who live in Phnom Penh are really humble and they're really dedicated. A lot of them also have become bilingual through the course of their years living in Cambodia, which is really cool because they speak two of the hardest languages in the world. I always felt really blessed when I was able to work with the Vietnamese members in Cambodia. I forget what it's called. There was a spider that lived in my house in Hanoi that was the size of my hand. It was like, some people exaggerate the size of spiders and I'm being honest when it was at least the size of my hand and it was very scary. And it lived in one of the bathrooms and we never ever ever opened that door ever. Um, but there was a transfer and I got a new companion and he didn't know this. And he used that bathroom and the spider got out. And so it was roaming around our house for a good few weeks and eventually I was on the phone with the zone leaders and I saw the spider and I started screaming and they thought something was wrong and I told them that there was a spider and I killed it and then I ran away and then my companion uh, when I told him what had happened he looked at me and he's like why did you kill the spider it was it was helping us it was eating the cockroaches it's like this size it was the size of one of the tiles that was on the ground of the bathroom, which were about this big. My companion and I were once teaching a lesson about the gospel of Jesus Christ, lesson three. And after teaching about you know, Christ's role and the atonement and justice and faith and repentance and baptism, we were talking about receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I meant to say uh, you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost by laying on of hands but instead I said you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost through a cutting off of hands and he was very afraid and he had to re-explain that. Luckily I was serving with a native companion who was able to stop and explain what I meant to say right there. Laying on back and then to cut off. Check. Pha Home, there's a pho restaurant in Ho Chi Minh City. It's about a three minute walk from the chapel that I served at. And I don't know if like they just added a lot of MSG or what it was, but it was amazing pho. Better than any other pho I've ever had in my entire life anywhere. Once I was eating dinner at a in a like a corner restaurant with my companion and it started raining 
and then after about two minutes it was raining so hard that we couldn't see outside the front window and it cleared for just a second just long enough for me to see um, a 20-foot tree just sliding down the road being blown by the wind baby duck egg it was a duck that hadn't hatched yet and they boiled it and then when you broke the egg open, you could see the head and the feathers and the feet and every part of that little duck just right there. I don't know if I did anything too dangerous besides driving on the wrong side of the road. I became one of those crazy people that I saw at the beginning of my mission. I remember thinking, what are those crazy people doing driving on the wrong side of the road? And then I started doing it. So. <laughs> I learned to play the piano because in a lot of the branches they didn't have a pianist so I was able to practice the piano a lot. Learned how to bargain. That was a big one. I had never bargained before. I got good enough to bargain that I stopped because I wanted to go out on a high, on a high streak of getting good deals. <laughs> I think the greatest life lesson that I learned is that I can be happy even while I'm imperfect, that I don't need to be incredibly hard on myself, that I can expect a lot and I can also achieve a lot, but at the same time I don't need to wait until I reach a certain level of perfection to find satisfaction with who I am, that I can really be happy with my progression and not just my perfection. Always keep a rain jacket with you because like buy a rain jacket when you get to Vietnam. I wouldn't recommend buying one here because they're a lot cheaper in Vietnam. But buy a rain jacket, keep it with you because if you get rained on then the old ladies in Vietnam will yell at you and tell, that, tell you that you will get sick. Try and find clothes where people won't see all of your sweat come through. They're really hardworking and they're really genuine. Um, I was really struck because they say what they mean, uh, but they also say it from their heart. And so it's cool to get both directness and a heartfeltness. One of the times I felt the most love like, and acceptance on my mission was at Christmas time. It's Christmas time now, but I was transferred to Cambodia after serving in Vietnam for about a year and a half, and I was heartbroken and just really, really sad. And it was on Christmas Day that I was transferred and I remember we all gathered, all the missionaries gathered in Phnom Penh and then I saw all of the, every single person I've ever served with get back on a bus to go back to Vietnam and I was left in Cambodia um, but I had a really good companion he saw that I was really sad and he bought me a pizza and just from that small act I was reminded of God's love for me and the reason that I was serving a mission was so that I could do things like that, serve other people and just seeing that small act, I felt the spirit from getting a pizza and that sounds kind of weird but uh, it was one of the more memorable moments on my mission and I'm really grateful to that companion who did that. I remember we had one investigator in Hanoi who had been investigating the gospel for a while and he loved the gospel and he wanted to serve a mission and he was reading every day and doing everything he needed to do but he couldn't come to church because of his work um, his he had to work on Sundays and he was really afraid of his boss he wasn't sure how to ask for a Sunday off or if he should just quit and then find another job so he could come to church. That was an option for, in his mind of what he should do is just quit so that he could find a job where he could go to church on Sunday. 
but that went back and forth for a month or two before and he just stayed at that job and it was really sad because he wanted to get baptized but he couldn't because he wasn't able to make it to church and we were working with him and trying to help him figure out what he wanted to do because he knew he wanted to get baptized and we prayed with him and he, we fasted with him and he went to work and he prayed and he said that the spirit gave him the courage to ask his boss for Sundays off and his boss who he thought would never ever give him a Sunday off agreed and it was uh, he called us on the phone that night and I know that through the Spirit and the grace of God, he was given courage to do something that would help him come closer to Heavenly Father. I served in Cambodia, Vietnamese speaking, from 2006 to 2008. And uh, I had been preparing for, uh, as a little kid for a mission. Um, I remember when I was an eight-year-old, my dad was teaching me how to pray. And he, uh, he was, you know, teaching me the different steps and telling me to ask for things. And when it came my turn to pray, I would, I remember praying for good companions uh, when I was a little eight-year-old kid. <laughs> um, and then, you know, 11 years later, I found myself in Cambodia serving with just awesome people. Um, it changed my life. Um, search, the, the choice to serve a mission was really hard for me, or really easy for me. But when the, when the time came to, to serve, I found um, there was some opposition. I, uh, I, was in, I, was at a non, I was at a school in Washington doing my freshman year. And I just remember my friends saying, you know, they're like, why, why, would you go, why would you go live in Cambodia? I'm like, well, you know, I made a choice to serve. And they're like, well, you can serve us. You know, they're trying to tempt me out of it. And, uh, I, really, I, re and I really love these friends, too. And they're still good friends today. But you know, I'd made that commitment from a little kid that I was going to serve. Um, one thing that inspired me to serve was listening to a return missionary in my ward. He had gone to Ensenada, Mexico um, and served the people there. And I, watching his testimony when he came back, just how, how joyful and humble he was from his service there. Uh, I just saw that it was something I really wanted. Um, he taught me a principle I will never ever forget. Um, he was having he was serving with a a native companion, and they're having you know just some companionship difficulties like like everyone has. And he said um, one morning his companion had you know done all the dishes and you know did his laundry for him, even though they were on, weren't on the best of terms. And he said it just completely changed his mindset, his attitude toward his companion and he realized um, a principle that day that stuck with him that service heals a wounded relationship and um, that was probably one of the most helpful things on my mission um, and with the gospel in general if we're having a issue with you know a friend or a roommate or a girlfriend or a family member um, service heals a wounded relationship um, I know that's what the gospel's all about, is kind of figuring out how, how we can all live in harmony and love and peace. But I just wanted to um, share a few thoughts about my mission in Cambodia. Um, it was looking back, just sharing all this, looking back at all the stories I have. It was the time of my life, you know. It was so much fun, just all the crazy things that happened, all the funny stories, all the interesting people that we met. Um, I actually kept a journal um, every night of my mission. I asked my dad what if he had any regrets from his, from his mission. He, he always said it was just one thing and that was not keeping a journal. Um, so if, if I could uh, encourage anyone it'd be to, to, to make it a fun process. Um, you can do the following and it'll make it so you can write a journal every night with ease. And I did this on my mission. We would, um, before I went to bed, I would just write down um, the funny stories that happened, the spiritual thoughts that came to my mind, 
um, the interesting things that happened and any any inspir you know any life goals that came to my mind I would just write those few things and it only took you know you know a minute to you know five ten minutes depending on how how much happened but now I've got a full record of you know what happened on my mission all the people we served the insights we had um, and all the revelations that that you'll receive but it my mission has changed my life um, from the discipline that we gained from you know keeping that regimented schedule to the language skills to the experiences to um, the testimony you know it's something it's like an anchor for the rest of your life if you're ever if you're ever um, kind of doubting yourself or you know your abilities you, you look back and you say look you know I, I did that you know I know that I can serve the Lord and give him my all and it's been it's been an anchor for me um, especially when life you know life gets hard life happens to all of us but um, it's been interesting to see um, through the changing times how much the Savior has been there for me um, and I I don't think I could have uh, endured some of the things I did without a mission especially in business and school um, serving a mission was hands down the most uh, productive use of my time from 19 to 21 I, I was in China a little while ago and I was just right on the subways I was just looking at all the hundreds and thousands of people there I was like you know if the Lord called me to serve in China right now I would be like ecstatic to go it would just be so fun to, you know learn the new language learn the new people and so my encouragement is just to absorb absorb it all just love the people love the food love the culture love the climate the crazy animals you run into <laughs> just love it all and uh, that's my encouragement to, to everyone watching this Gorn B. Hinkle actually dedicated Vietnam back in the 60s for missionary work before the war they sent four American guys into Saigon and um, one of them actually came back just a few months ago. It's really cool. He's a doctor now, and he's bore his testimony in Vietnamese. But yeah, so they had four American guys there four decades ago, you know. And uh, then they had to leave because of the Vietnam War. They had to be bailed out before the North invaded the South, which is crazy. And uh, and you know, there, there's baptisms, and actually one of my companions, his family was baptized back then and they had to go into hiding for all these years and so finally now that you know it's more you know more open more free they were able to come out and you know baptize their son he served with me and etc but even 2006 when I got to Cambodia we couldn't we couldn't send missionaries there's no missionaries in Vietnam and so we you know trained some natives and then in 2007 we sent in the first four native Vietnamese missionaries into into Vietnam. First missionaries since those four in the 70s. So it was really cool to, to have that kind of turning point. And from there, the church in Vietnam has just exploded. Now we've got multiple missionaries up in Hanoi and, and uh, Saigon, or Ho Chi Minh, it's got two names. So, um, so we have missionaries there, you can you can invite them to church, you can, they can be baptized, they can learn the gospel. It's almost perfect, except they can't go out and proselyte with their name tags. But we'll take what we can get, you know. Um, they've also had a lot of apostles. I got to listen to Elder Bednar come and talk to the saints. And that was awesome. Um, one of my buddies married a Vietnamese girl, and they brought her to that, she wasn't a member, they brought her to that meeting with Elder Bednar. And he opened, uh, he talked for an hour and then opened it up for an hour of questions. And she said that at the end of the meeting, she had tears in her eyes. She said, questions I've had my whole life were answered in that meeting. It was cool. It was cool. So Elder Bednar has done, he did a lot for the church. He met with government officials there. He did a lot for our freedoms over there too. We can now send in American passport missionaries there. Yeah. Which is cool. We haven't sent in a white passport American, but we've sent in like Vietnamese guys who grew up in like you know Arizona or Utah. We've sent them into.
Vietnam, which is really cool. So the church is growing there. The majority of them are Buddhist. Um, some are really devout and practicing. Some just say, hey, I'm Buddhist, you know. I'd say, you know, there's obviously a lot of monks over there they walk around their long orange robes. And, um, yeah. So in terms of religion, I would say, you know, there are a few devout. There's a, there's a good, big, pretty big Muslim community, some Catholics. You know, our church is growing pretty good there, too. Um, but one overlying mentality that the people have at least especially the Vietnamese in Cambodia is they would just say religion is religion all religions good you know they kinda just they just kinda like they know that all the religions kinda teach good things they don't really believe that like one is right or you know it was it was really interesting um, to watch that to talk with them and realize that a lot of them weren't passionate about religion at all they just kinda looked at it as some good institution that helps people be better, all of them. That was how they felt about religion. So they weren't too keen on learning just one and being true to it and being faithful to it, you know. It's kind of interesting. Whereas, you know, I've been to other places in the world, you know, and uh, like Islam, they'll be very passionate about it. You know, they'll try and convert me over to Islam because they truly believe that it is their, you know, one right path. So it's a different mindset, you know. It was almost this uh, um, apathetic, yeah, they had apathy, sorry, apathy, they had this apathy towards religion. There's a bunch, um, I'll mention some of the cooler ones in a second. One that we did, our go-to was just we would teach a free English class, um, which isn't super effective, it was good, it built rapport with the, the community and stuff, and we met some cool people doing it and provided service, taught them free, free English, you know, from American, and that's expensive for them to talk with an American, you know, to pay for that mentorship. So that was a service that was our kind of go-to. Like I told you, we, we rebuilt communities that burnt down, um, which was fun, crazy. One day, like, we were, we were rebuilding a community across, across the river, and I was, had a big sludge and I was breaking down some old brick stuff with this other guy that was helping out. And I was walking through the you know broken bricks and everything, and my foot sunk through, sunk down up to my knee. It was an old like, way, it was an old like outhouse that they had. So I stepped into like human waste from like months ago up to my knee, through broken glass. I was in shorts. Yeah, I'll show you a picture of that dude. It was so gross. And so like all these Vietnamese women came out with buckets, just throwing bucket after bucket on my leg, which is just covered. So I cut my leg up and. And then I had to like, my shoe was getting suctioned at, at the bottom, right, as I was trying to pull it up. So I had to like arch my toe up just so my shoe wouldn't fall off. So I got all these Vietnamese ladies running with bucket, you know, buckets of water over my leg. Still didn't come off, so I had to wash in their nasty river, which was like full of trash. <laughs> so that was exciting. Um, another service opportunity was, this is one that other people can do, um, um, is rebuilding houses, kind of like Habitat for Humanity. It was really cool, actually. So, a fa American family um, invested in the material, like lumber and nails and stuff, and came over. And we re re reinforced the stilts on this late, this old lady's house, this old grandma, her house, and we tore off a roof and built her a whole new roof. She lives out on the water. So that was a cool service opportunity. So I, I built it, rebuilt that house with that family, and then years later, their son, who was there, actually ended up going Vietnamese speaking to Cambodia. So it was so cool. Yeah, I, I was meeting with him in the MTC, and in his broken Vietnamese, right, he was just learning. We figured out that we had met in Cambodia when on that service trip. So 2007, we were serving together, and then probably four years later. He ends up getting called to my to that same mission that he went and served at with his family. Such a small world, yeah. That's so cool. Um, also, your service project, the you know donating eyeglasses. There's actually a charity. One of my good friends posted it on Facebook. Um, they're collecting more glasses, um, which is really cool. And and like I said, we know the doctor, Doctor Call, that goes and takes them out there and does free checkups and um, you know. 
tells them if you know they're nearsighted, farsighted, if they need surgery, and he directs them where to go to get free. So they have a clinic that does surgeries there. So really cool opportunities. Um, there's a lot of stuff in agriculture. Um, LDS Charities does a lot with rebuilding um, water pumps, you know, building uh, wells and getting fresh water to the people out there. Um, they also teach them agricultural um, techniques to get a higher crop yield with their rice. Yeah, really cool. We also we also donated um, mosquito nets, rice, you know, oil, cooking oils. There's a big flood two years ago. We went out and um, distributed a bunch of food and stuff to those families that got affected by the floods. Uh, and they're and like I said, they're such a kind people. You know, they're so appreciative of that. Feels good to serve them. So. A lot, of, a lot of service opportunities over there. There's a really cool experience. Um, it actually came from a girl that came to our English class. <clears throat> she, um, she's living in Vietnam. She's just visiting Cambodia. She actually got a blessing from her minister, her religious minister in Vietnam, to help her because she was kind of lost in life, didn't know where she was going, had no purpose. And she... Um, so she went to Cambodia and he blessed her that she would find her purpose, you know, her, you know, her, her kind of some guidance in life. And, um, she came to our English class and finally we, you know, we talked about religion with her because she was really interested in it. She had read the Bible and everything. And we told her about the Book of Mormon and we told her how, you know, this is another witness of Christ. You know, it adds, you know, to the fullness of the gospel of Christ. And, she just broke down in tears. Um, she was holding both of them. She's like, she's like, I've been looking like my whole life for for like the fullness, for the full truth. And she's like, now with like both of these together, like I have it. And it was just cool to talk with her, of like the purpose of life, where we came from, why we're here, where we're going, things that like she never really talked about. You know, she heard sermons and stuff, but it wasn't didn't really dig into you know the core her core needs and wants for that so it was a really cool experience to talk with her I just I, f I left that meeting just like floating on cloud nine you know I was so happy um, so we gave her that book Mormon she went back to Vietnam I wish I had like her cell phone number or something that I could follow up but we have no no contact information for her so I can only hope that you know she'll find She'll keep that book and uh, find find her way back. Well, the big one is in Siem Reap. You've got all the temples there. Um, you know, the big one that's in Tomb Raider. Yeah, that's a cool one. Also, I mean, the temples are great. They've got like a balloon you can take up at, sunri at sunrise to s look out over all the temples. And But I mean, they're some of the oldest temples in the world, I, if not like the oldest. It's really, really cool. And, um, they, uh, I think they actually just discovered a new one in the jungle, like the other, like a few months, a few weeks ago. We read this article, and they discovered like a new temple, like off in the jungle, um, which is just crazy. Because I mean, it's a tiny country, and people have been there for a long time. Um, like Vietnam, they just discovered a huge cave. Like it's just this little opening, right? And the Vietnamese never wanted to go into it because they heard howling sounds coming out of it. But finally, like Westerners went down it. And it's huge. I mean, you can fit like the biggest Boeing jets we have down the middle of it. That's how big the cave is. It opens up. And it's just like multiple gyms, you know. It's just huge. Um, so it's just cool stuff there. Um, Cambodia, you know, you've got you've got the coast coastline, Sea and Hookville, um, which is nice. You know, warm water. Um, Vietnam, in my opinion, is a little bit better for sightseeing. It's awesome. You got the whole coastline. You've got Halon Bay with the huge mountains, mountain islands, and you can actually like hike around and go in, and they open up with huge caves inside the island mountains. Yeah, that's actually I think one of the world wonders, or they're at least voting for it. But it's cool. You can go in. You've got the stalagmite, stalactite, you know, hanging down, just the crystal formations. Um, that's up in the north. Head down through the central, you've got the old capital of Hoi, Hoi Ang. 
and then you've got um, Nyachang Beach, just some of the best snorkeling and diving in the world. Um, they've got the longest cable car zipline type, you know, like gondola thing that goes over the water from the beach out to an island called Vin Pearl Island, and they built this little like ghetto Vietnam Disneyland out there. <laughs> it's really cool, um, you know, with rides and aquariums and water slides and beaches. Um, it's pretty fun. Yeah, it's growing too. They're just booming. Yeah, Cambodia and Vietnam right now are have good economic outlook. They're really progressing pretty fast. So from what I've studied, you know, in the mid '70s, he came through, and um, this this will actually kind of get into some of the history of why the people are the way they are, and why they why the Cambodians treat the Vietnamese the way they do. So it stems from that whole incident with Pol Pot coming through. Um, his regime came through and it was, you know, totalitarian. It was just, they, they, did, they saw the people um, differently than, than we do. And they basically, you know, mass murdered m millions, millions of people. And um, when you take out all of the educated people, all the people have glasses, we, we, they were killing, you know, innocent, millions of innocent people. So, I mean, that sets the people back so far. A lot of people in the up, a lot of the upper officials in Cambodia are actually Vietnamese. So Cambodia is pretty much run by Vietnamese people. Really interesting. But um, also, there's a lot of political strife sometimes during their voting. It gets crazy. Um, we actually had to spend a few days in our houses during voting, you know, for fear of, you know, protests and riots. A few years back, before I got there, apparently someone had thrown a grenade into one of the groups. Like, it got bad. Yeah, there's a lot of strife. Um, they would throw water balloons with acid in it. Yeah, it was freaky. So, um, yeah, so there's some political strife. Um, Cambodia has had some... Um, struggles with Thai, the Thai people on the border. They're fighting over this old temple up there, but and they had armies lined up. We thought they were gonna, you know, fight. That was during my mission. So I mean it's they're not without the, you know, their own trials and problems, but that kinda gives you some insight into um why they are the way they are and it's really it was interesting to watch. Yeah. So I got to Cambodia late at night and we had, you know, we met the mission president. We had a prayer with him. Everyone was falling asleep because we just flown, you know, 30 hours from Provo to Taiwan to, you know, Phnom Penh. And then, um, <clears throat> so I got to meet up with my trainer, um, you know, got it oriented, bought some food. The next day we go out to a meeting and my little, it's just this little Vietnamese guy you know, probably four foot something. And he's on this bike and he's riding through the, the crazy Phnom Penh, Cambodia traffic. And there's just motos, you know, motorcycles zipping by. And he goes through a red light. He blows through a red light and all these cars are going by. And I have to like try and follow him because I, no, I have no way to, you know, where we're going, how to get back, you know, no phone. So I had to like weave through all these cars just to keep up with my trainer. <laughs> it's just like, what am I doing here? But it, it was a blast. Yeah, eventually be, you become pro, you know. You can kind of weave your way around, but it was fun. It was an exciting uh, introduction to Asia. It's my first time there, so. There's basically just two seasons down there. Um, hot, so there's dry hot and then wet hot. And so like, if you get there from like, I got there in November, where it, which was, it was just hot. And I remember, um, my little, the little companion that I took off on the bike, my trainer, um, in December, he came outside and he was like shivering. And I'm like, he's like, it's so cold. He goes, I hate winter. We looked at the temperature, it was like 85. <laughs> he was cold during that. So I mean, range, it never got below like 80 degrees. So you got like November to January, February is like dry hot. Then you get into hot season, March through April, it's just so hot. It's just like, you're dying. Yeah, so some people would get to the Cambodia on their missions during that time, and they would just be like, what is going on? So, and then, um, you know, like, 
June, uh, June to August is like monsoon season. So it's hot, but then you just like, you'll feel a few drops and then it'll just pour on you. Um, that was fun. Like it would be dry, you know, dry, totally nice. And then you feel a few drops and just dump and there'd be like huge floods. Um, some really cool stories about that. It's probably the craziest things we ate were, um, I ate a tarantula when I was there. Yeah. Just this big old black tarantula. It's kind of crispy. kind of tastes like a burnt french fry. Um, that was exciting. But we'd, uh, we'd prank, we'd prank each other for our birthdays. We'd buy each other weird stuff at the market. Like, you know, you'd, you'd get a pig snout, box it up, wrap it, and give it to him for, for a present. Pig ears, you know, just weird stuff like that. Um, the markets are probably one of the craziest thing there. Probably our staple, what we'd eat every day, was uh, pork and rice. We'd eat that every day. Um, yeah, so rice, obviously, it's Asian, so they eat rice, but they would grill up this, you know, pork and throw it on. It was just amazing. It only cost like 50 cents for a box of rice with some of that on, so it was good. Um, I still, I love eating that. Um, but they had everything, you know, they had all sorts of really great soup. Um, the Vietnamese, since we served the Vietnamese people there, we ate a lot of Vietnamese food. And they had this famous soup called um, pho, P-H-O. Um, I haven't met an American that doesn't like it yet. It's awesome. And it's just basically Vietnamese chicken noodle soup, but it takes them like eight hours to cook it. Yeah, because they get, get, the, get the flavors out of the bones, they soak it, you know for for a long time so that was another staple um for drinks one of the awesome ones that probably saved my life over there was the sugar cane juice yeah they they had this big press and they'd put the sugar cane through it and it would squeeze out the juice and you they'd throw in some you know ice and a cup of water so that was awesome yeah sugar cane juice probably saved my life and like the in the heat there it was interesting for me because I had like it was my first time in Cambodia, so I didn't know Cambodian, I didn't know Vietnamese, I didn't know Cambodian culture or Vietnamese culture. Because when I got there, the first week I was living with three Vietnamese guys, you know. So I was living in a Viet Vietnamese like home, pretty much three guys from Vietnam, and then, but in but the minute I step outside, I'm in Cambodia. So I was called to serve the Vietnamese people in Cambodia. So I'd wake up at 5.30, exercise, study. We'd study Vietnamese for an hour. And then we'd go out and we'd be, all the signs would be in Cam Cambodian. And all the people would be speaking Cambodian. So it was crazy. Um, but the languages are really interesting. Um, Cambodian, you know, they have script as their writing style. So it's like a bunch of swirls and swiggles, which is really hard to learn for those guys. But um, Vietnamese and so Cambodian is a lot like Thai. They have the script and it sounds more like Thai, but Thai has tones. And then Vietnamese sounds more like Chinese because it came out of Chinese, but because the French occupied um, Vietnam for like 90 plus years, um, the French Romanized the Vietnamese language. So they took the characters that Vietnamese used to have and they Romanized it just like our writing system. So like I could teach you how to read Vietnamese, all the little rules and stuff in probably like an hour or two. And you could roughly read it, you know, and then you just have to work on your accent. So it's kind of cool. Whereas characters can take like a lifetime. <laughs> characters are so hard, you know. So that was one interesting thing. We have other than that very different languages, similar grammar, but uh, that was one of the hardest challenges was trying to learn Vietnamese in Cambodia. Because they actually speak, speak a different, you know, they'll change some of the things from Vietnamese in Vietnam. So that was a huge challenge. One day we were tracking through um, the city, and my companion, he's like, "Oh, there's snow! Like, let's take a let's take a quick water break." I'm like, I'm "Like, oh, you know, it's only 12:30. Like, let's we've just let's go, you know, track up this down this alley." He goes. Oh, no, I turn around, he's holding this huge thermometer that he bought, and it said 120 degrees. So I'm just like, okay, now it's a quarter break. <laughs> so it was, it was fun. So hot. Um, just common ones. You know, you can say, xin uh, chào is hello. How are you is quay hum. That's pretty simple. It uh, just means healthy no. It's their way of saying help. how are you. 
Um, uh, uh, means have you eaten yet? Yeah. Uh, means thank you. Those are, those are just basic, you know. Yeah, if you want to ask how much something is, you can say, Can I buy new thing? Can I buy new thing? So, <laughs> just basic things to get around. Really, if you just learn a few words, if you learn the numbers, you know, you can count to ten. You can, you can pretty much do a lot of stuff there. In the city, it's mostly just like basic apartment complexes, just rectangle, rundown, pretty poor. Um, actually, I mean, Cambodia's economy is growing pretty fast. I've got a friend there. She's got a nice home that's nice, nicer than a lot of American homes. Kind of the same Western style. They're kind of adopting that. Um, that's in the city. Out where I served, like in poor spots, I mean, they'd make houses out of, you know, metal sheets and wood and, you know, just live real poor. Like, especially along the water, they'd, uh, you know, live on st stilted houses. For the floods, as the, as the you know the river would rise up, so that was cool. You know, we'd walk around on planks to get to their house, board you know raised boards to get to their houses. Some people would have to take a boat. Sometimes they would just live on a boat, with a little roof over it. It was fun. Um, yeah, house a lot of houseboats. A lot of people live on the water. Um, but architecture, I mean, Cambodia outside the city, they have the old temples. Like you see in like Tomb Raider with Angelina Jolie, she she they filmed that in Cambodia. So you got um, you know Angkor Wat. You got all these cool old. I mean some of the oldest temples in the world. You know with Angkor Wat, just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, just huge ancient temples, really intricate, and they've got these massive trees that have been growing up for hundreds of years. So it's cool. It's it's a land, it's one of the, I think it's one of the, I think they're trying to vote at one of the world wonders or something, but, yeah. Siem Reap, Siem Reap is a beautiful city with all the temples. They celebrate their Khmer New Year during March. They've got some fun traditions. They, uh, they'll pick up, um, what they'll do is they'll gather like a bunch of like water balloons and fill them, you know, fill up water balloons and get baby powder. And they'll like throw them at each other and like throw baby powder on each other, <laughs> like get them soaked and throw powder on them. And as missionaries, they we weren't off limits, so like, <laughs> like we'd be like riding down, all of a sudden you'd get like bombarded with water balloons. <laughs> it was so funny, like going down the alleys. I remember we were like riding our bikes down the road, and we saw like we were about to turn down one road, and we saw them at the at the end of the at the end of the road with the water balloons. We go to the next one. There's like more. Finally, we realized that they had us trapped. So we had to like weave through these people like with water balloons flying back and forth. So it was fun. It was so crazy. Yeah, they'd be like lobbing them off rooftops, and it was just kind of a fun tradition. And it kind of welcomes in like the hot the hot season, <laughs> which is super hot. Like I said, during like March, April, it's just like killer. Um, but that was one fun tradition. Southern Vietnam today was once Cambodia. So if you've got Cambodia, let's see, from your perspective, if you've got Cambodia, it's kind of this shape, kind of shape my fist. Vietnam comes, it's like a long country that wraps around it, and you got, you know, the ocean over here. So Southern Vietnam today used to be Cambodia. So this whole section, after they took out Pol Pot, the Vietnamese kept southern Cambodia, and it's now southern Vietnam. And so the Cambodians had a um, derogatory word that they would call the Vietnamese in, in Vietnam, and they would call them Yuan, which means land stealer. And so they just had this negative sentiment towards Vietnamese people. There was times where, you know, they would burn down their, the Vietnamese communities just because they hated them, um, which is really sad. So part of our, you know, as a missionary, you have the four hours of service every week, roughly. Um, we would go and help rebuild those communities that burned down. Um, but it's just, it was hard to see that, you know. It was really hard for us to hear Cambodians call these people that we loved and served. Because I, I served the Vietnamese people there primarily. And it was hard to see the the people of the country you're living in hate on this other, you know, minority group. I think a lot of it stems from 
we were talking about Pol Pot and what happened in the 70s, you know, he came through, it was just a mass genocide, you know. He just, they killed millions of people, anyone who could read, had glasses, they were killing baby, like babies, it was really bad. Just millions of people, and so, and that was just a few decades ago. So it really just kind of threw them back hundreds of years, you know, in terms of progression and everything, but but they say, you know, when when you've hit rock bottom, it's only up from there, you know. So you've got this humble people that are just so hardworking, so kind and so humble, you know. They're really nice. Um, I'd say the overall average, you know, like obviously literacy rates can be down because of that. But um, the people are, I would just say they're really, um, really friendly. Like you can just go and make friends with any of them. They would just be more than happy to be your friend. You know, and uh, yeah, I miss them. <laughs> They're really, really fun. They're really good sense of humor. Like if you learn any of their language, they'll they'll just think you're the coolest. You know, like even just saying you know Jimbaripsu, saying hello to them, they they'd be stoked. Yeah, it's fun. They also closed down a few days for the Chinese New Year. Three days, just all the shops are closed. Yeah, they'll be lighting off little fireworks and. You know, it's a, it's a family thing. They all go out to the to the provinces and to be with their families, and they hang out and drink and have, you know, little snacks and stuff. And they were so nice. We'd still go out during that time, and they, you know, they'd welcome us in and give us a soda, and yeah, it was fun. In the city, it's just a bunch of main, you know, mangy old dogs, nasty dogs, rats. Tons of rats would come out. Um, it was, yeah. In the city, there's not that much wildlife. But they do have a zoo outside the city. It was really cool. Monkeys and all sorts of wildlife out there. But mostly just rats and dogs in the city. Uh, spiders. <laughs> yeah, we were tracking it. <laughs> we were going down this alley and we, we came across this spider. I'll show a picture of it to you in a little bit. It was the size of my palm. So its fingers were the size of, were like, that far out the width from from like foot to foot and then its body was about the size of my thumb I have big thumbs so it was huge it was a spider where its body was that and its legs were like as long as my fingers skinnier and it had this cockroach hanging out of its mouth yeah I'll show you the picture in a sec it's crazy um, so it's eating this cockroach so we like set our little like you know preach you know um, little like gospel pamphlet next to it to see the size it was like half the size of the whole pamphlet it was un i haven't seen anything like it yeah but, so that's wildlife mostly rats dogs insects oh my gosh the ants yeah you leave out like a little bit of food there'd be like an army of ants yeah it's just like thousands of ants crawling through your house and even if you like sealed everything up they'd come through the outlets in your house. <laughs> that was fun. It was exciting to try and outsmart the ants. I had never felt endangered really. I felt so safe. The only thing, I mean, just don't go like withdraw money by yourself at like midnight in some sketchy area. That's like the only thing I probably wouldn't do if I were there. But like during the day, like I feel safer there than I do in the States a lot of times. So, yeah. Yeah, just really, really gr humble and gracious and kind people, really friendly. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, Cambodians are so nice. <laughs> yeah. One day it flooded outside our house, and like we had to walk like waist high just to get back, like holding our bikes up through the water just to get back. It was crazy, but um, it would scare the cockroaches out of the road, right, outside, and they'd come into our house. We had this much space underneath the door, and so the cockroaches would all start running, like tons of them, like hundreds of them. And so um, the church had given us, you know, the raid bug spray, and so, like, we were doing everything. We had, like, a lighter. We were just, like, spraying to keep these, like, cockroaches out. And at that time, I was living with another American. I had a Vietnamese companion, and he had a Cambodian companion. And so our, our little Asian companions were, the ones that got past us with the spray, they were running, like jumping on us so they didn't get into our house, these huge cockroaches. So we've got, we videotaped, we've got this scene of us just like in pandemonium trying to keep these cockroaches out of our house. Yeah, 
it was it's it's exciting. I should make a YouTube video of that. That'd be that would go viral.